Talk Show. Recorded live. Hi, folks. This is Mike again, and I'm with uh, York from Juggler 66. And um, uh, thank you for those who have joined us and those who will listen to the future. Um, York, once again, has a lot of information. Sounds like we're going to be talking a lot about the Jesuits and et cetera. Um, before we get started, though, I want to, I feel prompted to read. I read this chapter quite a bit in the show, and I'm going to read it again. I feel strongly that it needs to be read again for those that are listening or will be listening. Revelation 18. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. And the cup which she has filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived uh, deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her. And when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand far off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour hath so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company of in ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? 
And they cast dust on their heads and cried and weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged, avenged you on her. And the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voices of the harp, harpers and the musicians and the pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee, and the sound of the millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the can- of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. A voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of earth, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And um, I felt very strongly about reading this. Um, For those who are listening now and those in the future and those who feel that they are the the opposition, if you will, they they would call Jesuits (laughs) because I'm pretty sure at this point they're listening to the show um i have it's pretty overwhelming some pretty strong evidence of that case and i just want to let you know that we love you we care about you we want you to know that jesus christ loves you and as he says in this his holy word he cries out to you um to come out of her come out of the system that you're in and be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues. Your perception might be that we're, we are your enemy, but we're not. We actually care about you. The reason why we care about you is because the Spirit of Christ is in us, and therefore we care. We want you to know the truth and have you come on. It's not an easy road in this earth, in this world, to follow the truth. But the rewards are worth it. And just once again, you know, we ha- we are. I am very grateful for all those, and I emphasize all those that are listening. And may God bless you, and may you come to the truth. And with that, my friend Jorg, let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, first and for all, thank you very much for that reading of Revelation 13. Um, we are living in the end times and whether it takes another 150, 200 years until Jesus comes or it takes two days, uh, it is always important to keep the word of Jesus in mind and especially the revelation because when read with uh, intelligence and understanding, you can really make something out of the history that is falsely presented in your schools, universities, most of encyclopedias, and uh, of course in movies and all that stuff where history is taught. And uh, the book or, or the Word of God, uh, 66 books called the Bible, 39 of the Old and 27 of the New Testament, that is the real truth, and from that you will get a lot to understand the doings of this world that we are in today, whether it will continue for a day or two or for a year or two or for a hundred or two years. It doesn't, it doesn't matter exactly, but you will understand much more of the things that is going on when you read it with the understanding from the standpoint of the Bible. Like you will also understand who is your enemy, who is the Antichrist, when you analyze it from the standpoint of who is when you ask the question and when you go after the question, who is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist? 
something that has been talked on this radio show already along, uh, I think, with, uh, um, with Walt um, and, of course, with Tom Press, who you had on, who was so kind to read the book Roman Living at the Reformation by Henry Griffin Guinness, um, which is uh, on another radio show, easy to find. Uh, we can provide the links if anybody asks for that. Um, and that is very important to understand the here and now where we are in. And, and we are in the last days. So the book, the, the Bible has a beginning that is Genesis and it has an end that is Revelation. And Revelation deals with the end of the world and we are in the end of days. So reading the Revelation is very important. And for that, thank you very much that you brought that back into our, uh, in our, into our memory and that you brought that back. And um, also not to forget... Um, that we are doing this broadcast not for our fame, but we do it in the name of Jesus Christ. And like you already said, we love the enemy like Jesus taught us. Love your enemy. Uh, love everybody. But you don't have to love their actions. I despise the actions of the Roman Catholic Church. I despise the actions of my government even. I despise the actions of the Jesuits. But that doesn't mean that I despise or hate the person who is doing it. Because that person is just a deceived person. And I will do whatever it takes, whatever is in my power, and you do the same, and we all here on the call, I think, are thinking the same about that. We will all do everything that is in our power to try to open the people who are asleep to the truth, to waken them up and to open their eyes to the truth, and that they can see for themselves that the some years that we have been given on this earth are just a test to see if we are worthy for eternal life. And you know how you cannot imagine to be in heaven with Jesus and have a life everlasting there. The same you cannot imagine what it would be like to be in hell everlasting and being... Uh, tormented with brimstone and heat and I don't know whatever in hell there is coming for, for the rest of eternity. So because you cannot imagine that, it is very important that you have to make the right choice and whether you go to the fiery place or you go to the heavenly place. If you ask me, I would rather go to the heavenly place and I think deep in their heart everybody would do so, but it's a question of what they have been taught when, from when they were young. Because, you know, why are the people bad? Or why, why are there so many bad people today in the world? That has to do with the education. That has to do with what, you are, what environment are you born into? When, when, when you're a child and you're innocently born, that's why Jesus loved the children and, and said uh, every child has more right to come to, the, to, to heaven than any, uh, any grown up anyway. Um, because they are, well, uh, relatively free of sin, I would, I would like to say, children. Um, whatever environment they are born in, um, that is what they take on. When you are born into a criminal family, you probably will become a criminal. And that's not because you make the choice, but that's because you don't know any better. So... For most people who are in this uh, realm of politics, in this realm of the Roman Catholic Church or whatever, they were born into that and they don't know any better. And when the Roman Catholic Church says the Bible is not important, here's our catechism, that is important, people believe that. And they don't compare the two things. And that's how they get deceived and that's how they do not understand that there is the truth. So, because of that, Michael, I think that it's very important that you start with the reading of Revelation, whether it's 1 or 22 or 18, what you just read, I don't care. Revelation is a very, very uh, important uh, part of the Bible because um, those are actually the words of Jesus and the things that he gave to the apostles for the time that went after he went to heaven. So the things are to come. That is revelation mean to reveal what's going to come. Yeah. So by that, thanks again for reading that, part 18, and now I'm going to continue with uh, 
something I have prepared. If I find that because you know, <laughs> I prepared I prepared so much. I have a few. I I think about ten websites uh, opened here and uh, all that stuff that I wanted to read. And um, it's actually an, an article that I fell about some weeks ago that is from a website called The Unhived Mind. Uh, you probably are familiar with that site. Absolutely. That's, I've looked at it quite a bit. So. And there is a lot, a lot, a lot of information on And he also, um, I'm not quite sure, is it Craig Oxley, the guy who made Unhived Mind? I'm not quite sure. Uh, I, 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 I don't remember his name. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I, I, I think it was Craig Oxley. Uh, Alan Lamont told me a uh, time ago. If I'm not mistaken, anyway, the guy who made this site, and that's mine, also in the beginning made a lot of videos. Um, and there we, should, we should try to see if we get it, to get him on the show. Um, no, I, I, think, I think he is uh, quite um, under the surface because he has been attacked a lot. And uh, I don't know if he's easy to find and easy to contact. Um, okay. I know that uh, the videos that he made on YouTube are hard to find for the moment. Uh, they are not so much around anymore. Um, he has been very hard attacked because of all this work that he did. But anyway, uh, I found an article here um, that I'm going to read to you. And from that article, I will divert into other things. But it all has to do, most of all, with, first of all, the new world order that we are going to, to live in, which is, when you study it, exactly nothing else than the old world order means the restoration of the full temporal and spiritual power of the papal system of the Roman Catholic Church over the whole world that has been taken away from them during the Reformation for a part, that has been taken away from them during the wounds that has been afflicted to one of the heads that looked like a deadly wound that was the arrests from General Berthier of the Pope in 1798 that end the 1260 year reign of the Roman Catholic Church uh, as, foretold in, uh, as foretold in the Bible prophecy. And um, then this deadly wound was again um, repeated in 1870 when uh, Italy as the last country of the world also revoked the temporal power of the Vatican. But also Italy has been very much uh, in the run for starting the healing of the wound in 1929, February 11th, to be exactly, uh, when Mussolini signed the uh, lateral treaty, or the lateral treaty with the Vatican. And uh, the Vatican was at that moment, again, a sovereign country, even though it is just a little dot on the earth, but no matter, it's a sovereign country. And by that it was started giving back the temporal power. And from that moment on, you will see that increasingly other countries started having diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And the Vatican has today, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, 200 uh, foreign um, yeah, embassies, it's not called embassies, but offices in, in foreign countries for their representation, like we have from country to country, embassies. So that means the world power is almost uh, completely restored. The wound is almost healed. It's still healing. It's, it's not healed yet, but uh, it will heal. So you can follow that when you read Revelation and you know where we are. Anyway, I don't want to give out too much from this article that I've prepared from the Unhived Mind. That uh, article is called Jesuit Domina Domination Veiled by Diversion Agents of Deception. Uh, very interesting. It starts by uh, calling out a certain Jim Condit Jr. I don't know if you are familiar with Jim Condit Jr., who he is? Not offhand. No. It doesn't mean I don't know who he is. I just can't. The, 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 name, okay. the name of the face. That's okay. I um, I researched uh, a little bit about him, and uh, I think he was uh, also candidate for the Senate. Um, the interesting thing that I found, and I think that is relying a little bit to the article, that's why I'm uh, reading that, is in 2002, John 
Condit Jr. became the first political candidate in the United States of America to reach the public over 50,000 watt radio stations with the message that the 9-11 cover story was false and that the evidence pointed to unsettling conclusions such as that controlled demolition had been used to bring down the World Trade, Tower, World Trade uh, Towers in New York City as the airplane crashes and resulting jet fuel fires were complete, completely insufficient to do so. Yeah. Can I stop you for a second? You can stop me anywhere, anytime. Okay. Did, did, you, know, did you talk about him last week? Uh, just a little bit. Yeah, well, that's where I heard him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I know. Now I all recognize it, the story. So, go ahead. My apologies. Yeah, uh, about the fuel fires, uh, just something that I insert here right now for people who are not that uh, uh, not that well studied into the 9-11 uh, false attacks. Uh, the official story tells us that a Boeing 7, I don't know, 767, 737, whatever, uh, with a lot of fuel crashed into the tower and that, that fire that was ignited by the jet fuel uh, caused the steel, uh, uh, how you call it, the steel frame, the inner steel frame to melt. But you have to understand uh, two things. When jet fuel uh, burns under optimal, optimum perfect conditions, it can reach a temperature between 700 and 750 degrees centigrade. Right? But when it has optimum conditions, there is white smoke. And when you look at the towers when they were burning, the smoke that came out of the towers while burning was black. Black smoke is always an, a signal that the fire that is burning has a lack of oxygen meaning it is not burning to its most efficiency. So it cannot reach the maximum temperature of 700 to 750 degrees. That's point one. Point two is steel has a melting point of 1400 degrees centigrade. And this is not a conspiracy theory. This is a physical fact. This cannot be refuted. This cannot be discussed about. This is not a matter of opinion. This is fact. So when anybody of the official people who tell that the official uh, the official version of 9-11 is because jet fuel melted the, the, the steel frame of the towers can explain to me how that the fire that can reach maximum half of the temperature needed to melt steel achieved that. I would really like to hear that. Anyway, I continue reading this little article here. Uh, so that the airplane crashes and, re jet, uh, and resulting jet fuel fires were completely insufficient to do so, as I just explained. Today, over 100 university professors Retired military men and former government officials are stating the same conclusions publicly at www.scholarsfor911truth.org and other prominent websites. For example, uh, you have this uh, architects uh, for 9-11 for, for truth site and, and pilots and, and, and all this stuff. And there's also a rapidly growing list of published books, DVDs, and CDs blowing the lid of the phony 9-11 cover story, which is still being used to push us forward towards World War III in the Middle East and towards a communist Nazi-style police state in the United States of America. So he was the first political candidate to reach the public over 50,000 watt radio stations with the message of 9-11. It's a false story. That's just a little bit about the tone uh, this um, person, uh, Jim Conder Jr. Why do I start with him and why do I start with what he told? Because the article of the Unrest Mind starts, quote, this Jim Conder Jr. is a Jesuit temporal coadjutor who knows full well what he's saying is devious and totally incorrect. Now, 
he says here in the beginning of this article that Jim Condon Jr. is a Jesuit co-editor. And here is right the moment where I will leave this article, even after one sentence, just, <laughs> to tell you a little, about, about, a little bit about the hierarchy of the Jesuit order. So what does it mean to be a Jesuit coadjutor or temporal coadjutor? These are words that probably everyone in this broadcast here has already heard, but sometimes does not know exactly what it is. So I did a little bit of research on that, and I found a paper from a Jesuit that was written here in Leuven, where I live in Belgium. Uh, and he made a 72 pages paper about the hierarchy of the Jesuits. And I'm going to read two and a half pages from that right now. And whenever you feel like it, Michael, please interrupt me to say this is interesting or this is not. But I will start now, and uh, I will tell you about a little bit about the hierarchy of the Jesuits. The Society of Jesus is a Christian male religious order. Its members are called Jesuits. The order was founded in 1540 by Ignatius of Loyola, a Spanish nobleman in the service of Ferdinand V, sovereign of Castile. By the way, and uh, stop quote for the moment, keep in mind what I'm reading now is an official paper from a Jesuit in Belgium who made an official paper even with interviewing Adolfo Nicolas, the superior general of this time at the moment, uh, and this paper is dated from 2013, right? So every information that is in here is from the Jesuits themselves. Continue reading. A cannonball that hit one of his legs in 1521 in Pamplona shackled him to his bed for a long time. During that period, he made a conversion, and this was the beginning of a long personal quest that culminated in a spiritual experience. His quest was later captured in the story of the pilgrim and his spiritual experience in the spiritual exercises that are meant to help others follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. The spiritual exercises form the foundation of the spirituality of the Jesuits, also referred to as Ignatian spirituality. The exercises were written by St. Ignatius between 1522 and 1524 and formally approved in 1548 by Pope Paul III. The work is set up as a series of meditations, prayers, and mental exercises and divided into four thematic weeks. It is not meant as a reading book. It is a kind of methodology to learn to discern between good and evil spirits in order to act with the praise of God. The exercises were originally carried out in a secluded retreat over a period of 28 to 30 days, but today they are being offered in varying forms. For instance, the exercises in daily life, Ignatius himself provided the pos this possibility in the introductory notes of his exercises, more specifically on the 19th footnote. These exercises are carried out over a longer period, several months, up to a year and a half, while continuing normal daily activities. The exercises can also be undertaken by non-Catholics. More recently, Protestants adapted the exercises, emphasizing it as a school of contemplative prayer. The exercises are very popular among lay people in the Catholic Church, but also among people of other denominations. They remain, up until today, one of the cornerstones of the novitiate training of Jesuits. In everything Jesuits do, the discerning element like worked out methodologically, methodologi methodologically sorry, in the spiritual exercises play, plays a key role. When deciding which way to go, what structures and organization to put up, how to evaluate, what has been done, and where the redemption or change is needed, Jesuits always use the discerning process as a guiding principle. The discerning progress is present on all levels of organization, individually and collectively. Jesuits live together in houses, not in monasteries, where they form communities. Sometimes the apostolic work is located in the same house, but most of the times this is not the case. They work in schools, colleges, universities, seminaries, cultural initiatives, 
give retreats, minister in hospitals and parishes, promote social justice and ecumenical dialogue, and so on. Jesuits receive a long training or formation that can take up to 20 years. The classical trajectory looks like this. And now I will read to you this uh, long training. Are there any questions? Okay. The classical tra trajectory looks like this. Two years novitiate. Here they find out whether their vocation is real or not. Second, then comes first vows. The vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Here the novice becomes a scholastic, entering onto the path of priesthood, or a Jesuit brother, also known as temporal coadjutor. Okay? The scholastic continues with two years of philosophy, two years regency, means full-time apostolic internship, if possible, in one of the Jesuit works, five years of theology on university level for Europe in Paris, Madrid, Rome, or London. Then followed by ordination. And after ordination, there are two options that are decided upon by Rome. First, the Jesuit priest is chosen for profession as a spiritual coadjutor. He takes vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Second, the Jesuit priest is chosen for profession as a professed on the, uh, on the four vows. The fourth vow is the vow of obedience to the Pope. Next point, five to six years apostolic work or additional studies. Continued by one year tertianship, a third year of novitiate. After this third year, the Jesuit priest takes the final step by effectively taking vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And, if chosen for profession as a professed of the four vows, obedience to the Pope. Finally, the final vows. The general superior invites the Jesuit to pronounce perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and some are invited to also pronounce the fourth vow of obedience to the Pope. The formation of a Jesuit brother is less structured. Before the Second Vatican Council, Jesuit brothers were mainly active as cooks, tailors, farmers, secretaries, accountants, librarians, and maintenance support in their communities. After the Second Vatican Council, which recognized the mission of all the Christian faithful, Jesuit brothers started taking up more and more roles in ministries outside their community. Today, their formation and roles can be highly academic. Some brothers work at university professors, more practical, pastoral counseling and spiritual direction, or still more supportive. So I'm going to quit reading this, and I hope that you listened very well and that you got my emphasis that I put on the fourth vow. You know, this fourth vow, this professed vow of the Jesuits, there is a lot of information out on the Internet, but there are also a lot of people who say this fourth vow that you are going to tell from us, that is a lie. And here we have an official paper written by a Jesuit in 2013 that deals with when you go into the hierarchy of the Jesuits and when you follow this 20 years of education to become a Jesuit, that you have to take this fourth vow even twice. And why is that? Because this fourth vow is parted into two parts. And I also have, of course, prepared reading that vow I don't know if I shall, shall I do that right now or shall I do that later on? What is your opinion, Michael? Uh, are we under, otherwise too far away of the topic of the, of the article that I wanted to rule? <clears throat> no, I mean, go, go with how you feel you want to do it. So why not? Okay. Why not? Why not do it? So I'm, I'm going, I'm going later into it because I have to continue something else here on this paper on page okay. 38. I prepared that also on page 38. 
Um, just give me a second, but I find the stuff where I was on here. Um, page 38, yeah? Okay, then I have to start on page 37, I guess. Um, which deals with the front of the society of Jesus today. Quote, How are Jesuits today behaving when being in contact with externals? Are they performing a show in the form to corporate wording, press and marketing talk, authentic behavior and client talks, and so on? During the interviews, I learned that Jesuits today, or at least those that are at the top of the organization, do not like to talk too much about themselves or their organization because they feel there is always the risk of becoming too proud and too self-assured and also because they think it might be perceived as we know better. So they seem well aware of something like in the front of an organization and the way this front can be perceived by externals. This does, however, not mean that they are not acting upon the front. In Rome, I discovered two interesting examples. I want to elaborate on a bit more, but, <clears throat> but there are without any doubt many other examples. In April 2013, Father Mark Rothschild, uh, Society of Jesus, published a book called De Loyola au Vatican, Idee reçue sur les Jésuites. This is French, and it means uh, Loyola at the Vatican, uh, received ideas on the Jesuits. This book is an excellent example of how the Society of Jesus tries to handle some of the most persistent perceptions or misunderstandings about the Jesuits that are circulating up until today, both internally and externally. It is, in my opinion, a very clever, balanced way of dealing with the front of the organization because it tries to bring up the right information to a broader audience meaning that it is not an attempt to glorify the Jesuit or its founder. On the contrary, it takes a certain critical distance. It is, for example, not avoiding some of the more darker moments in the history of the society. Good examples of all are this. And now I'm going to continue with four examples, and that uh, finishes this, um, uh, this little part of the book. The Society of Jesus has been founded by Ignatius of Loyola. Okay, this statement is not wrong, it's not totally wrong, says Rothschild, but it is important to add, and his first companions. So, I don't know why that is so important, of course he didn't do it alone, but he was the key man, I think without him there wouldn't have been the Society of Jesus as it is today. Well, I know but, that in the foundation of the Jesuits, Loyola had a, a half a dozen followers. Mm -hmm. and he, met, he met through school, so absolutely. All... Yeah, he was not alone. That is, that is absolutely absolutely right. But it's just he he takes off the focus of Ignatius of Loyola like this. You know, you have to see this this is how they are perceived internally and externally. And it's most of all for externally because externally you say, oh, Jesuits are oh, that's Ignatius of Loyola, and then this Rothschild comes on and writes this book and says, it's not totally wrong to connect Ignatius of Loyola to be the founder of the Jesuit order, but it is also important to add, and his first companions, see, to All take right. the heat off him. You see what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. That's the idea. <clears throat> okay, second point. Quote, the Society of Jesus is a military organization with little or no democracy. End quote. It is neither a military organization nor a democracy, says Rotsa. It differs from some other religions, uh, religious orders, where government is structured horizontally, whereas the government of the Society of Jesus is structured vertically. That's why in all these organigrams of things like the Jesuits, you have a pyramid. All right. The third point, quote, Father General is called the Black Pope. End quote. The fact that the General and his Jesuits have been wearing black robe in line with the habits of their time, the fact that the headquarters of the Society of Jesus are close to the Vatican, the conviction that the Society was founded by an ex-military, the fact that the Jesuits have this fourth vow of obedience to the Pope, who could 
count on his elite troops to conquer heretics or unbelievers. This all contributed to creating the image of the black pope, says Hotzad. But the only thing Ignatius and his Jesuits really wanted was to link their mission to the universal mission of the church. It was an act of faith rather than an act of ecclesiastic politics. And again we come into the fourth vow mentioned here, who could count on his elite troops to conquer heretics or unbelievers. So here he gives us a little glimpse in this official paper on the fourth vow. That is so much being refuted by people who try to dismiss the Jesuits as just an unimportant organization. And the fourth point, quote, the Jesuits were in the church amongst the most tolerant with regard to the Jews. Even today, some like translating the SJ, the Jesuits are putting behind their name, and which means Societatis Jesu, with Sind Juden, which is German, Sind Juden, meaning are Jews says WhatsApp. Do you get that? So the people say, that people who say because they put SJ, Society of Jesus, or Societatis Jesu, behind their name as a title, they translate it with the German Sind Juden. SJ, are Jews, says WhatsApp. <laughs> At the time of Ignatius, the purity of blood, especially in Spain, played an important role. From the moment the Jews and Moors started entering the church, Inquisition started focusing on the so-called new Christians. Ignatius stayed, them, stayed firm throughout his whole life. In his answer to Pedro Zarate, October 29, 1555, responding to a question of Don Gomez de la Silva, Count of Eboli, he writes, quote, I am told that your lordship is unhappy that we accept so many new Christians in our society. Society cannot and should not exclude anyone. She shouldn't refuse any talent or any man of quality, whether he is an old Christian or a noble knight or something else. If, he is religious behave, if his religious behavior is useful and consistent with the universal good, so the point of view of Ignatius was crystal clear. However, when Father Paolo Saccini wrote in his History of the Jesuits about the Jewish background of one of the first companions, and that was Father Jacques Eleni, the Jesuits of Toledo in their provincial congregation of 1622 reacted vehemently and asked Father General Viticelli to remove what was said about Eleni's. Quote, we ask the withdrawal of such a large stain on the memory of such a father, they said. The Society of Jesus also gave in to the ideas of the time, says Rotsav, by accepting the, de the decree during the Fifth General Congregation in 1593 that stipulated that someone with Hebrew or Saracen background could not be admitted into the society. It took the society until 1946, after the Second World War and the slaughtering of millions of Jews in the so-called Holocaust, to abolish the decree of 1593 during the 29th General Congregation. So what have we just learned from a Jesuit himself? That the second superior general of the Society of Jesus, Lainez, Jacques Lainez, was a Jew, and that in 1593 there was made a decree that was working up to 1946 that there were no Jews allowed in the Society of Jesus. And why is this important? Because when we later go into the fourth vow, the vow of obedience of the Jesuits, we will see what is written there about Jews. Hmm. 
So I'm going to end this paper that I have from the dry. Uh, I'm going to end that right here. But first and for all, uh, first and for all, I thought this hierarchy that I was reading in the beginning from this paper. I think that was very interesting, and now you know what a temporal coadjutor actually means, and how much Jesuit education he got. Right? Okay. And you see, to become a full and deeply involved member of the Society of Jesus, you have to do 20 years of study. I mean, two years philosophy, two years regency, that's four. Five years theology, that's nine. Then the ordination, then five to six years apostolic work, that's 15 to 16 years. One year trenches, that's 17 years in the final years and so. And the first two years that started as a novitiate, so you come to 20 years. This is not something that you do, you do overnight. That means you commit your life to this. Exactly. So, now we know what a temporal coadjutor is, and I told you who Jim Condit is. I'm going to continue reading that article, starting with the first sentence again, because, quote, This Jim Condit Jr. is a Jesuit temporal coadjutor who knows full well what he's saying is devious and totally incorrect. He will not tell you about the full roots of Freemasonry and the Jesuits' kingdom of Aragon Templars take over <clears throat> of the entire Freemasonry division of the mystery schools, which are currently run by the greatest educated minds, the Jesuit order. He will not do this because he does, it does not suit his current agenda to protect the order and its minion Catholicism, which is not Christianity. Many agents like this will also, if pushed, claim the Jesuits are Jews in order to save face if they like to push that Jews rule the world, never explaining the difference between Torah Judaics and Sabbatean Frankist Talmudic labor Zionists. I guess he pushes that Evelyn the Rothschild is the king of the world? What a joke. The Rothschild family are a tool of the Jesuit order to, bring, to help bring about their world order complete Aragon Templar takeover. I'm going to stop reading this right here because the Rothschild family is mentioned. And a lot of people are here and there saying something about the Rothschilds and think they know it all. Well, when you really want to know how the Rothschilds came to power, why the name is Rothschild, why do they have a red shield, where their money comes from, you have to read Rulers of Evil by Kappa Sorsen. On page 160, we go a little bit back, but I will start reading on page 160 of the book Rulers of Evil. And by the way, Michael, at this moment, I have to say I really, really appreciate that you have started with broadcasts where I think it's Tom Fress reading the book Rulers of Evil. Uh, uh, no, actually, I, 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 I'm actually doing the reading of. of oh, you're doing it. Well, yeah. I haven't listened. I haven't listened yet. So. Uh, maybe next time you want to, um, we can we can share. <laughs> okay. I, I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to take a part also if you if you're okay with that. You don't have to do it all by yourself. But at this moment, I think it is absolutely crucial to inform our listeners about what um, Tapasosi wrote in his book. And to understand Tapasosi and this book, you have to just read the foreword where you will understand that Tapa Saucy is actually a descendant of French Huguenots. And what are the French Huguenots? Well, Google the massacre of St. Bartholomew, and then you will see how the Jesuit order killed thousands and thousands of Huguenots, Jesus-following, Bible-believing, true Christians in France, with the St. Bartholomew Massacre in 1500 and something. Very, very interesting. And he is descendant of that. So I'm going to quote <clears throat> book Rulers of Evil by Kappa Sorsi, page 160. Quote, Although Bishop von Hontheim lived in Trier, that's in Germany, 
He was Archbishop of Mainz, also in Germany, at the Rhine. His jurisdiction extended to the Mainz Principality of Hesse Hanover. Von Hontheim was thus the spiritual counterpart uh, of the ruler of Hesse Hanover, Frederick II, not to be confused with the King of Prussia, Frederick the Great, who was also a Frederick II. Frederick II of Hesse was married to the aunt of the King of England, which made him George III's uncle. Born a Protestant, Frederick subscribed to the Rosicrucian style of Freemasonry. Although Jesuits converted him to Roman Catholicism, he nevertheless remained a Rosicrucian secretly active. Frederick of Hesse was one of Europe's richest rulers. Much of his business was handled by his son, Prince William, also a Rosicrucian Freemason. William's specialty was facilitating war. He drafted able-bodied male Hessians, outfitted and trained them for battle, and then sold them to his English cousin George, who used them to fight alongside with own, his own red coats. Every time a Hessian was killed, William received a reparation in the form of extra compensation. As casualties mounted, so did his profits, which he loaned out at interest. In September 1769, Prince William appointed Meyer Amschel Rothschild of nearby Frankfurt to transact some of his financial affairs in the capacity of crown agent. Aware that the Rothschilds are an important Jewish family, I looked them up in Encyclopedia Judaica and discovered that they bear the title Guardians of the Vatican Treasure. The Vatican Treasury, of course, holds this imperial wealth of Rome. Imperial wealth grows in proportion to its victories in war, as the Jesuit empowerment Regimni Militantis Ecclesia implies, the church at war is more necessary than the church at peace. According to H. Russell Robinson's illustrated Armor of Imperial Rome, Caesarian soldiers protected themselves in battle with shields painted red. Since the soldiery is the state's most valuable resource, the Council of Trent admitted this in preferring the Jesuits to all other religious orders, it is easy to understand why the red shield was identified with the very life of the church. Hence, the appropriateness of the name Rothschild, German for red shield. The appointment of Rothschild gave the black papacy absolute financial privacy and secrecy. Who would ever search a family of Orthodox Jews for the key to wealth of the Roman Catholic Church? I believe this appointment explains why the House of Rothschild is famous for helping nations go to war. It's fascinating that, as Meyer Rothschild's sons grew into the family business, the firm took on the title Meyer, Amschel, Rothschild, and Söhne, which gives us the notarium M-A-R-S. Meyer, Amschel, Rothschild, Söhne. M-A-R-S, Mars. Isn't Mars the Roman god of war, whose heavenly manifestation is the red planet? There's powerful Kabbalah here, and there's hardly an acre of inhabitable earth that hasn't been affected by it in some way. End quote. Some thoughts on that, Michael? Or speechless like I when I read that first. <laughs> uh, it, it, makes, it makes a heck of a lot of sense, actually. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I guess what's worth through my mind is all the people that I dealt with, say, a year ago, 10 months ago, 8 months ago, that when I started bringing up the Rothschilds' connection to, to uh, Rome and how they responded to me. You know, you were mentioning earlier about a, a lot of the folks, they're, <clears throat> whether they're Jesuit coadjutors or they're something else, I don't know. Uh, a lot of folks, really, they just they stop at the, the Rothschilds. It makes them happy. 
it's like the, you know, it's ingrained in a lot of us to hate Jews. And so it makes a lot of sense to put them fall. You know, they've always been the scapegoat for Rome. On top of that, though, being Jewish, yet having the red shield, which is the Roman symbol, so are they really Jewish? You know what I mean? That's a question that needs to be asked, because what does it mean to be Jewish this day, these day and well, age? Well, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting that you ask this question, because a few days ago, um, we too had already that conversation, Right. Where I told you that there are two kinds of Jews that have to be reckoned with. Mm-hmm. Um, the first kind of Jews that is here in this world right now is that kind of Jews that are Jews by descendants of the tribe of Judah, mm-hmm. one of the twelve tribes of Israel who are by blood, by blood. Not not a race, but but Jewish because they come from the Judean tribe, right? Uh-huh. And then there are these Jews who can also be uh, 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 normal people, other people who converted to the Jewish faith. So when when you talk about Jews, you really have to do about two kind of Jews. You have to do whether with the bloodline. All you have to do with people who are just following the religion of the Jews. Right. Because when I convert to Judaism, my blood doesn't change. I'm, I'm, I'm still the same blood. I'm still born a Gentile. I can convert to the, to the, to the Jewish faith, but that doesn't make me a Jew. Right? Uh, I guess so, yeah. So what about the Rothschilds? Well, the, the, the real name of uh, Maya Angel Rothschild was Maya Angel Bauer. means farmer. So his normally last name was farmer, Bauer. I don't know if he was a Jew from the tribe of Judah. I don't know if he was a converted Jew. But the Rothschilds are today conceived as Jews, and I don't care... If they are blood Jews or converted Jews, the only thing that is important is that these Jews are being used by the Jesuits to take the blame for their actions. All right. And I want to... Or is it even more sinister, Jorg, that they're Roman Catholics pretending or portraying to be Jews? Yes. <laughs> Which is what I argue. Um, when you, when you that, can, that's essentially what's happening, is that they are just playing the role of a Jew. When you can't kill your enemy, join him. Yeah. You know? And get him from within. Yeah. People who think that Jews are ruling the world, I can only point to the Bible. Luke 21, 24. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, there it is. Yeah. And well, well, we are told that the times of the Gentiles will not end until Jerusalem is no longer ruled by other nations. Who rules Jerusalem today? Rome. Wow. <laughs> really? <laughs> ah, well, the Oslo Accords in 1993 where Shimon Peres signed over 60% of the city of Jerusalem to the Vatican. So the Vatican rules Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. What does the Bible say? Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So it's not yet fulfilled. So we are living in the times of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles are the bad people and not the Jews. Absolutely. Of course, they are using Jews like the Rothschilds, like oh, Bernanke and all these Federal Reserve uh, CEOs that they had and then all these Jews in Hollywood and all these Jews they put out there. But behind them, behind them, there is a controlling group that is Gentile. 
and that's just the point people have to uh, have to accept and, and, and have to study have, and just have to study it you know so uh, well, I find it amazing is how many people quote unquote Christians are totally convinced that it's the Jews yet the Bible itself you just use the verse we look at the, the Daniel 70 weeks uh, you know, and what happened after uh, Stephen's being stoned? You know, the, the day, the time of the Jews is over. You know, and um, but I guess you know people just don't want to. They want to accept what the Bible has to say. They want to have somebody else tell them what the truth is. <laughs> but thank you for bringing up uh, twenty-one four twenty-four. You know, I mean, how does one argue with the Bible, the Word of God? Well, of course, we cite the Bible as a source of the truth. The problem is, uh, when you look at the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, page 496, the Roman Catholic Church says about the Bible, quote, The supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. It is unhistorical, end quote. It's so it's so evil, isn't it? It's satanic, but to its core, my gosh! People, come out of her, please, come out of her. <laughs> yeah, we can just repeat uh, Revelation 18 verse 4. Of course, we can do that all night. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and continue reading the the article, or are there any other questions about the Jews uh, or, or this, this Jew point that I was just making? I mean, it's, it's quite obvious. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I, first of all, I appreciate you bringing it up, and it needs to be brought up more often. There's an awful lot of people out there, whether it's like guys like Fritz Spring Myers or the, the smaller names, people who are, are not addressing this. And when you do bring up Rome, the connection uh, with what's going on in the world, they just they just they attack you. Now, I've been told that he's done a, a video recently addressing Rome, but it's nothing compared to the it's you know a drop in the bucket of those worked, and I personally have had that ex- been attacked by a guy like Chris Springwires and others for bringing up Rome and their connection with the with the Rothschilds and the fact that the Rothschilds are actually subservient to Rome and not the other way around. And mm-hmm. people really believe that one little family, one Jewish family, controls the world. They are totally deceived, and they're clueless of how the world works. Just well, who? It never did. Never did work that way. <laughs> <laughs> whose who's ring do all the presidents and kings in this world kiss? The the, the ring of the Rothschilds or the ring of the Pope? <laughs> that would be great. There are pictures of people kissing the ring of the Rothschilds. That'd be great. But you know what? <laughs> Doesn't happen, does it? <laughs> <laughs> no, only in the imagination of some folks. <laughs> only in the imagination. Okay, I'm going to continue reading the article, and please interrupt me whenever you feel like it, okay? Okay. The Jesuits were already in control of the Rothschild. The Jesuits were already in control of the Rothschild family through their house of Pavolacini, Venetian banking power, using the Rothschilds to hide away their vast wealth from the Jesuit South American reductions. This wealth could not be lost to the Vatican, who had suppressed the order in 1773. What was the option? To use the Protestant banking house of the Rothschild. For this, the Jesuits would grant the family eventual guardianship over the Vatican treasury once their takeover was completed along with the protection within their new Templar world order. Um, Just a little pause in reading here. I have to say something about this, because otherwise I get lost of it. This wealth could not be lost to the Vatican who had suppressed the order in 1773, right? The Jesuit order was forbidden and only lived on in uh, in two countries at that time. In the German state, Germany didn't exist in that time, of course, but in the, in the state of Prussia, which was uh, a Protestant state, and in Russia, the Russians, Catherine something, gave protection to the Jesuit order in the time of their suppression between 1773 and 1814. 
And it is known by anybody who studies a little bit of the Illuminati that Adam Weishaupt, who was a professor teaching canon law at Jesuit Bavarian University of Ingolstadt, that he was the founder, so-called, of the Bavarian Illuminati, which were founded, strangely enough, strangely enough, just in the time between the Jesuit suppression of 1773 and the founding of the United States in 1776, because on the 1st of May 1776, 1st of May, the Illuminati were founded. That was the organization the Jesuits had been working on for worldwide to have another front come out in the time as long as they were officially suppressed by the Roman Catholic Church. Very, very interesting history. The Rothschilds were the people who financed Adam Weishaupt in the founding of the Illuminati. I think when you dig a little bit deep in researching the Illuminati and the founding of it, you come after that, but the Rothschilds were giving him the money. That's why they did it, because they were working for the Jesuits. Because they are the guardians of the Vatican treasure. And especially that part of the Vatican treasure, that's not from the Vatican, but that's from the Jesuits. Who are the revived Knights Templar? And their treasure, that is so-called, never been found after their suppression in 1307. By the way, raise your hand if you know what happened. 13th of October, 1307. Where does this suspicious belief of Friday the 13th come from? <laughs> the arrestation of the Knights Templars on Friday the 13th in 1307, when they were forbidden. That's where that comes from. And these Knights Templars, these revised Knights Templars, are the Jesuits. And when they were suppressed in 1773, they founded a new front organization for them that helped them to do their thing, even though they couldn't do it the way they did before, as they were allowed. And so they founded the Illuminati, the Bavarian Illuminati of 1776. And whenever you're in America and you hold up a $1 bill, you would see on the back a pyramid, and on the on the bottom of the pyramid there is engraved the number 1776. And you can believe me, that has nothing to do with the independence of 1776, the United States of America that was achieved. That has to do all with the founding of the Illuminati. Anuit Captus Novus Ordo Seclorum. Continue reading. It is as simple as that, folks, and nothing more. I can name numerous people of far higher stature who would not entertain going on news broadcasts like a pipsqueak such as Evelyn de Rothschild. David Rockefeller is commanded by Jesuit soldier Thomas Smollett. Evelyn de Rothschild is commanded by Jesuit soldier Dermot Preston. Both Rockefeller and Rothschild are small fry in comparison to certain Venetian and Italian banking houses. And the small few we speak of, the ones you never hear about from the mostly controlled so-called alternative media. Too many temporal coadjutors will make out oh sorry, too many temporal coadjutors will make out the Catholic Church has been persecuted whilst forgetting who has been the biggest enemy of all mankind from its roots in Babylon and onwards. Yes, the Catholic Church. Roman Empire continues. The Catholic Church has not been destroyed by Rothschild. <laughs> the Catholic Church has been destroyed by the Jesuit order which started in 1814 to 1870 onwards as revenge for 1773. Do you honestly believe the Jesuit order was suppressed for nothing? 
Not only the Pope did this, but Jesuits have been removed from many nations and time and time again for their devious, deadly meddling. You see this protection of Catholicism, not Christianity, by that David Livingston as well. The same anti-Jew agents who will then have the nerve to say something about the suppression of the Jews out of nations as if they, were, as if they are so bad whilst ignoring the Jesuit suppressions. A classic case of double think and double speak, all to suit their agenda of diversion. Ask yourself how the Catholic Church gained so many followers, and it was through threat of torture or, and death. Is it any wonder weak people joined such a vile organization? People like to conveniently forget these types of facts. The heart of the Vatican is not weakened. It is stronger than ever, except it is being transitioned as well into the new coming into the coming new world religion known as the Luciferian doctrine, no different to the rest of the Jesuits' cult, such as Mormonism, remembering they got the Union State of Utah from Jesuit soldier Jean Pierre de Smet, by the way, a Belgian, who handled Brigham Young and the leader of the Scottish Rite, Albert Pike, the author of Morals and Dogma. 33rd degree Mason, speaking 16 different languages, and author of the letters to Manzina in 1870, where he spoke about the coming three world wars. Just have to pop this information in here, that's maybe the one or the other, for that is me. Not forgetting the Jesuits created the first 25 degrees of the Scottish Rite, whilst the other eight degrees were completed by Alexandre de Grasse, the son of the Order of Knight of Malta Francois de Grasse, making sure the 32nd degree honored his Jesuit masters. The intention was on dominating all Freemasonry of the middle and lower levels through the Scottish Rite headquartered in Jesuit Washington, D.C., and of course control of the United Grand Lodge of England. No longer would the Sinclair Templar Masonry of the Grand Lodge of France be separate from the only Knight Templar continuum, the Aragon Templars, who hid in the order of the Calatrava and the order of the Montiza, and as we all know, the Los Alambrados, before becoming known as the Jesuit order. An order created by the powerful Spanish Borja family and their handled Ignatius Loyola the only Templars to be allowed by the Pope to survive the suppression in the 14th century and sent to the ancient kingdom of Aragon, the only Templars in their own eyes left whilst all others were seen as impostors now, impostors to be absorbed or killed, ready for the rebirth and complete control for the future. Through infiltration and devious Jesuit trickery, all Freemasonry was subordinated to the Jesuits. We must understand the Jesuits are not Catholics at heart, far from it. They are the masters of witchcraft, which originated with Nimrod, the worshipper of Saturn. The same Jesuit order worshippers of Saturn, whereas the Vatican is more aligned to Jupiter as the son of Saturn. The Jesuits command the mystery schools, as many insiders will inform you about, and who have been taught by them within the illuminated system of the order of the Bavarian Illuminati, making sure we understand that the Los Alambrados were the original Illuminati before the order of the Rosy Cross and before the Jesuit created order of the Bavarian Illuminati in 1776. Today, the Rosicrucian and the Jesuits are one, as you can imagine with the agenda. The ultimate goal is the perfection of man through the hermetic degrees and alchemy. Just going to stop here. Through the hermetic degrees and alchemy. Well, when you follow a little bit um, Pastor Mike online, Mike Hoggart, he did already for the moment, I think, five videos on the singularity. Watch this videos. Pastor Mike, Michael Hoggart on YouTube, and watch his videos on the singularity, and then you will understand this uh, 
alchemy stuff that they are talking here about, and witchcraft, and magic with CK. Very, very interesting and eye-opening information. Continue reading. They desire the destruction of time, separate climates, gender, race, and class. Well, separate climates and gender? We have here in Europe for the moment the uh, very, very controversial action by all governments in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, foremost, of early sexualization of our children, where when they are put in the kindergarten at four years old are being told to undress and touch the others everywhere in their bodies, plainly, and they are creating different genders here. We are talking about the sodomites, not only about the gay people and the lesbian, we are talking about the transsexual and the transgender and the intersexual and the, um, I don't know, it's, uh, you have to look that up, it's seven different genders they create, not man and woman like we have, no, it's seven genders they create. This is exactly what I'm just reading here about. When you follow this a little bit, and I have videos uploaded on that, but the videos are in German because it concerns uh, mostly for a moment Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, all countries German-speaking. Uh, I even uploaded a, a video on my second channel, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday on that, uh, on that subject, German-spoken. But that's exactly what this article says here, and this article is from 2012. They desire the destruction of gender. That's exactly what they do with their early sexualization um, by uh, accepting uh, homosexuality uh, everywhere, also in the United States of America. There is now this legalization of same-sex uh, marriage all over, all over going on. You have then this uh, lesbian uh, uh, in Texas, uh, Houston, the mayor, uh, the woman is a, is a lesbian, and she was going to attack the church by asking the pastors to give their sermons uh, to her and all that stuff. So you have the control of the state and the church, you have the combining of the state and the church. Okay, I'm not trying to deviate too much here from the, from the subject, but just they desire the education, uh, the destruction of time separate climates, gender, race, and class. They believe they can join the heavens <clears throat> with earth and the masculine with the feminine. It's all their occult worship of the moon and Venus hermaphrodite gods. In order to part destroy the different climate, the addition of a second sun is needed. This will be accomplished by the near future with NASA's project Lucifer using a probe funny enough, named after Jesuit-trained Giovanni Cassini. Um, I just read this word. It's the cult worship of the moon and Venus hermaphrodite gods. For so everybody who is not aware of what a hermaphrodite is, um, look at um, Baphomet. That is the prime example of a hermaphrodite god. means someone who has... has uh, feminine as well as masculine sexual organs. So when you look at Baphomet, there's a rising a, uh, an, an obelisk between his legs and he has a woman's breasts. Um, that is a hermaphrodite god. So it means the melting of men and women. That is why this gender has to put away. There is no man and woman anymore. You can be whatever you want. This is the teaching they do. They start teaching that even in little children, that is always to go to this hermaphrodite because that is what they worship. Continue reading. These people, like Jim Condon Jr. and David Livingston, wish to ignore the true power of sovereign Washington, D.C. through Georgetown University. How convenient! The land of Washington, D.C. is Roman Catholic and was given by two Roman Catholic families named Carol and Pope. Land taken from part Virginia and part Maryland, giving you their idol worship blasphemy known as Virgin Mary. You all know that the non-Christian Catholicism gives more focus on Mary than Jesus. 
This is moon goddess and her waters worship, and the reason the Pope is known as the Holy See, S-E-E. If you add an A and remove the E, you get C S E A. Men going to C S E A are known as C men, C men. Well, let's join all together and take away the A, and then we have the semen, S E N E N, in the waters of the feminine. It's all fertility. The merchant system of the Saturn worship. Phoenicians was perfected by the Roman Empire and today it's based upon Vatican canon law. This is known as maritime admiralty law, which now asserts all true forms of law across the globe since the merchant takeover in 1933, with the start of the takeover happening from 1870 onwards. <sighs> Heavy stuff, huh? Heavy stuff. So we just had the mention of the Carroll family and the Pope family. I will not go into the Pope family, but I can tell you that that was crazy enough. A person called Francis Pope who gave <laughs> who gave who gave land to the United States <laughs> together with the Carroll family. Francis Pope, and today we have turned it around. Pope Francis. Yeah, coincidence. Nah, nah. So if you do not know who the Carols are, and there are quite a few people in the United States of America who do not know who the Carols are, then you even have no idea of the real founding of your nation. It would be absolutely too much to go into the subject of the Carols you had three. You had John, Daniel, and oh, I always slip one. Oh. Uh, John, Dan, uh, Daniel, and uh, Charles Candle. Uh, no, not Charles. Charles, Charles. Is, it? is it? Yeah, Charles Carroll of Carroll. Yes, but I always miss one when I count them all three. <laughs> Thanks for your intervenience. <laughs> uh, uh, it would it would be too much to to to, to go into that in uh, completely uh, deeply. But I will read a little part of who John Carroll was. He was born in 1735, and he died in 1815. John Carroll, he was the first Roman Catholic bishop and archbishop of the United States, serving as the ordinary of the Archdiocese of Baltimore. He is also known as the founder of Georgetown University, the oldest Roman Catholic university in the United States, and of St. John the Evangelist Parish, Rock Creek, now Forest Glen, the first secular diocesan parish in the country. John Carroll was born to Daniel Carroll I, a native of Ireland, and Eleanor Darnell Carroll of English descent, at the large plantation which Eleanor Darnell had inherited from her family. He spent his early years at the family home, sited <coughs> on thousands of acres near Upper Marlboro, the county seat of Prince George's County in Maryland. Several remnants surrounding acres are now associated with the house museum known as Darnell's Chance, listed, to, uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places and part of the system of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission for Southern Suburban Washington, D.C. Carroll joined the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, as the postulant at the age of 18 in 1753. In 1755, he began his studies, his studies of philosophy and theology at Liège. This is in Belgium, where I live, 50 kilometers from my home. After 14 years, he was ordained to the diaconate and later the priesthood in 1769. Carroll remained in Europe until he was almost 40, teaching at St. Omer in Liège and acting as chaplain to a British aristocrat traveling on the continent. And a lot of the traveling in the continent that he does between the years 1769 and 1773 and so on, you will get from the book, take a guess, right, Rulers of Evil, about the same pages where I just read about um, the Rothschilds. There's a lot on the European education and traveling on the three carols in Europe at that time. 
When Pope Pius VI suppressed the Society of Jesus in 1773, Carroll made arrangements to return to Maryland. The brief suppression of the Jesuits was a painful experience for Carroll, who suspected the congregation for the progression of the faith, propagation of the faith, that is what the Inquisition is called nowadays, of being responsible for his ill-informed decision. As a result of laws discriminating against Catholics, there was no public Catholic church in Maryland, so Carroll worked as a missionary in Maryland and Virginia. Carroll founded St. John the Evangelist Parish at Forest Glen in Silver Spring in 1774. In 1776, the Continental Congress asked Father Carroll, along with his cousin, Delegate Charles Carroll of Carrollton, who lived between 1737 and 1832, fellow Marylander Samuel Chase, 1741 to 1811, and Benjamin Franklin, 1705 or 6 until 90, to travel north to the valley of the St. Lawrence River at Quebec and attempt to persuade the French Canadians to join the revolution with the lower 13 colonies, where just 13 years before been forced to surrender New France to the occupying British army at the end of the Seven Years' War, French and Indian Wars. Although the group was unsuccessful, since the British government had earlier made concessions in regards to practicing of the Catholic faith and the use of the native language, it made Carroll well known to the government of the new republic. It is said that Carroll was excommunicated by the local Quebec bishop, Jean-Olivier Briand, for his political activities. Snubbed by the local clergy on the orders of the Bishop of Quebec, Carroll took an early opportunity to accompany the allying Franklin back to the colonial capital at Philadelphia. The Jesuit fathers, led by the Carrolls and five other priests, began a series of meetings at White Marsh in eastern Baltimore County, the beginning of June 27, 1783. Through these general chapters, they gradually organized the Roman Catholic Church in the United States on what is now the site of Sacred Heart Church in Bowell, Maryland, Prince George's County. So this gives you a little, a little bit an idea of who the Carols are. Um, I'm going to continue read the article from the Unlife Mind now. Just a second. <clears throat> the whole merchant system is mastered by the Vatican. Your soul, property, and rights have been taken away by the Vatican before you were even born through numerous papal bulls which tie into the Sisti Qui Act, 1666, mastered at Temple Bar in New Jerusalem by Emperor King Juan Carlos of the new unholy Roman Empire. Let me read that again because this French, I know that, but I can read it. There's, by the way, a very good German channel by the name of Konotabi on YouTube who made a video on the City QV Act in 1666. You have to understand German, of course, to understand that. City <clears throat> um, so QV, uh, when you translate that, uh, that, may, that means he who lives. So that's a paper bull on City QV from 1666, well, just take the one away, 666, and you see how satanic probably this paper can be. The city of London has been under Vatican since day one, but especially since 1215, when all kingship over the region was stopped entirely due to the signing of the Magna Carta, nullifying a contract with the Pope from 1213. Exactly the same reason why today the treasonous sovereign dame of Malta, Elizabeth II, cannot enter Jerusalem without <clears throat> permission and can never enter in any of her vile imperialist regalia as she is merely a member of the temple but not its power. The land is sovereign and once again, like Washington DC, it's controlled by the Vatican. The false queen of England took her title of sovereign from the Vatican who created it and granted it to papal bull Atterni Regis from 1481. 
Are you starting to see the bigger picture here? You have Washington DC, City of London, and Vatican City, all sovereign and all commanded by the Vatican Roman Empire continue. Howard Everett Hunt of the CIA told you all in the video I have online that the Jesuit Order is the greatest intelligence agency on earth and that he did not know that they, uh, that they do it, uh, but they do, I'm sorry, and that, they, and that he did not know how they do it, but they do. What does that tell you? I noticed that Eustace Mullins claimed that British intelligence was the premier intelligence agency on earth and the oldest. Well, this is totally incorrect, and I have to insert here uh, Eustace Mullins, oh, well, a, a very great author of, of some things. Eustace Mullins was a Jesuit coadjutor. Well, this is totally incorrect. The oldest intelligence agency is the entity going back to the middle 16th century and commanded by the Jesuit order. This agency is far older than what has been made out, but what do you expect in a game of diversion today? The entity are the greatest intelligence gatherers on earth made up of Jesuits for intelligence and assassination. They are the Hashashans of today, <clears throat> shall we say, and you might be interested to check into Ignatius Loyola's connection to the Hashassans, again, going back to their roots, working together in the Crusades of old. The Jesuits have mastered Britain since the late 18th century and the city of London Corporation since the start of the 19th century. They had always had their infiltration systems in various organizations gearing up for takeover. For instance, the Jesuits had a lot of power within the Honorable East India Company, which was created and mastered through the worshipful Company of Nurses. There has always been Jesuit influence on and off in the early days with the British Empire, even though you would never have thought so. This was especially so from the early 17th century. Then, from the 19th century onwards, that was it. The Jesuits had the city of London and everything of the Vatican and its own and its order of Malta. All the visible wrongdoings of the British Empire were then blamed on Protestantism when it was the Jesuits mastering everything and using the Protestants as bait, getting their agenda completed whilst causing hatred against Protestants suiting the Council of Trent. Now in the more modern world, we have the ignorance of Catholic atrocities whilst much hatred of Protestantism. How perfect for the continuing counter-reformation of the Council of Trent, don't you think? Here's an example for you. Let's take the slavery for a minute, and let's note how Protestantism takes all the blame. What about the Jewish slavery and Catholic slavery? These do not seem to get a mention today, do they? Why has all the slave deaths at the hands of the wicked, vile Spanish been ignored? How's about how they had to bring blacks in because they had killed mess of American natives prior? Have people all of a sudden forgotten that the Spanish Empire controlled much of America at one time? Or even who sold the blacks to the slave masters of the West in the first place? Let's take a look at who it was sending their black slaves to rape and kill white Protestant women. It was the Catholic slave masters who were also the most wicked of slave masters treating their slaves like shit on their shoes. Most of the Protestant slave masters treated their slaves well, and many of the slaves did not have too much of a problem working for them. Something not taught in your history class, eh? I wonder why the worshipful company of haberdashers and mercers took that out of the education system. How's about the origins of the Ku Klux Klan? being Protestantism defending against the chaos of black slaves from the Catholic slave masters. Eventually, the KKK became the corrupt Catholic system you know today, which comes from Albert Pike taking over. As I said previously, Albert Pike was handled by Jesuit soldier Jean-Pierre Desmet, and Pike was sovereign grand commander of the Scottish Rite created by the Jesuits for the takeover of lower and middle Freemasonry. Take note of the KKK clothing, 
being almost identical to Catholic Italian secret societies and the ancient crusading, the Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, run by Grand Master Bruno Plata. The black peoples could have continued their race and culture in Liberia if it had not been for the Catholic Jesuits putting a stop to it happening. All for the same reasons, they continue to aid and push for migration into the United States and worldwide in order to destroy national sovereignty and, of course, to destroy its race and culture. If you want to understand this more, you will have to study the hermetic, hermetic mindset and read Practical Idealism by Richard Tonegrove, Kellogy from 1925. Evelyn de Rothschild does not even come close to the power of Emperor Juan Carlos of Spain, the protector of the holy sites of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. By the way, forget Jews if you want to see the power you need to look to the origins of the Normans and the Gallics. Once again, we do not see proper explanations of the Sabbatan Frankist Hofjuden, Hofjuden, that means court Jews, Serving the king, the Pope, Rommel Evelyn, is a useless merchant pawn and nothing more. The as seen on TV pipsqueak trumped by, up by an alternative media, which is controlled by the American Protective League, continuum protecting Rome still to this very day. Never forgetting the conspiracy arena is riddled with those who blame the Jews as Protest and Protestants, but never focus on the harlot and its internals. Reminds me of how Alex Jones had David the Rothschild on his show, which should have rang alarm bells instantly, but still the flock came in like the lambs to slaughter they have been for so long. I'm going to pause a second here because have you seen the interview of Alex Jones and David the Rothschild? Uh, I haven't seen that particular one. No, I have seen that. He was uh, in his studio. He was in his studio on the telephone with David the Rothschild, and he called him all kind of bad words that I can't repeat here uh, because my belief system forbids me to take words like that in my mouth. Who was calling who bad names? Uh, he was calling him on the cell phone. Oh, uh, Alice Jones was calling... The yeah, yeah. Was okay. David, David the Rothschild, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this young guy, you know, who sailed around the world in his plastic boat and all that stuff. So he's calling it to, to his face or, or online? I mean, not on his face, but... Uh... He, he called him. He called him during a show. He called him during a show. I saw that show. I saw that show. I, I, I saw it once. And how did David... Uh... Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't care. But I mean, when you don't get at that moment, that is all a setup, and you don't get it. Never. Then you never get it. You know. <laughs> right. It, it, it's 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 great that um, I think Craig Oxley uh, has this side, uh, mentioned this here and uh, reminds him of how Alex Jones had David the Rothschild on his show. And the, when you don't know that, Google it and, and and listen to it. It's absolutely worth listening. Uh, it's absolutely worth listening. Uh, so, will you consider Alex Jones a co-adjutor? Me? Yeah. yeah. Of course. Me too. Alex Jones. So, Alex Jones is a co-adjutor. Alex Jones is working together with Tex Mars. Tex Mars married Alex Jones to his Jewish wife, and his Jewish wife has a father who is a knight of Malta. And Alex Jones is part of the CIA program Mockingbird. Right. Well, I knew about Mockingbird. I had no idea that he was married to a J Jewish gal whose yeah. father was a Knight of Malta. Father-in-law, yes. Her father-in-law was a Knight of Malta. His father-in-law, her father, is a, is a Knight of Malta. Which kind of makes that... And also so, the connection, of course, to Tex Mars, who states on his own website that he is uh, Jesuit educated. So the question being then is, you know, how do you be a, how can you be a Jew at a Knights of Malta? Well, that brings us back to the point that I was telling you before, that you have two kinds of Jews. 
You have Jews who convert to the Judaic belief system, and you have Jews who are born racial Jews. And of course, when you convert to Judaism in the belief system, then you convert, can you convert to everything. Then you can be what they call a crypto Jew. Right. So you can play, you can play, or pretend to be a Jew, but ultimately, Rome does not give anybody uh, a, a well, a person to become a knight of Malta unless their first allegiance is to Rome. Of course. Yeah. You know, what, are, what, what are the yeah. odds of some average Joe from Texas that would have be related to, to a Knights of Malta <laughs> by marriage? And uh, you know, it's just it, the more and more you learn about Alex, Alex Jones, Jones. Alex Jones is not the average Joe from uh, from Houston, Texas. Uh, Alex Jones is, after his own saying, a descendant from people who came with the Mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> There's a video on where he states that actually, and Walt is my witness. We listened to that both. <laughs> yeah, and you know, when 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 talking about how can you be a Jew and how can you be um, a Jesuit at the same time, that's very easy. You only have to go into the Jesuit oath, the fourth oath of uh, obedience that we were talking about. Um, because there it states, I'm going to read this uh, part of the oath for this moment. My son, heretofore you have been taught to act the dissembler among Roman Catholics to be a Roman Catholic and to be a spy even among your brethren, to believe no man, to trust no man, among the reformers to be a reformer, among the Huguenots, to be a Huguenot. Among the Calvinists, to be a Calvinist. Uh, Calvinist. Among other Protestants, generally, to be a Protestant. And obtaining their confidence, to seek even to preach from their pulpits, and to denounce with all the vehemence in your nature our holy religion and the Pope. And even to descend so low as to become a Jew among Jews, that you might be enabled to gather together all information for the benefit of your order as a faithful soldier of the Pope. End quote. A Jesuit is whatever he wants to be. A Jesuit is a corpse, a zombie. He is dead because he has no mind of his own. He is whatever his superiors tell him. And when we go further in the oath, you will see that when the Catholic Church says white is black and black is white, a Jesuit accepts white for black and black for white. Or good for evil. Right. It also goes on. 20 lines. years of training, Michael. Don't forget it. I read it to you. 20 years of training. This is 20 years of indoctrination of Jesuit spiritualism, <coughs> of spiritual formation. That is 20 years of indoctrinating your brain with their stuff. 20 years, day in, day out. They are mush in the hands of their superiors. They are Manchurian candidates. They are brainwashed. And you have to see you have different levels. Of course, on the top that is different because they know very well what they do. But on the lower levels, they have no idea. The same that when you order, when, when you enter a, 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 a Masonic temple and you say, I want to become a Freemason. Well, okay, you get ordained. You're a Freemason on the first grade, second grade, you're a Master Mason, the third grade, you think you know it all? Of course not. You're a third grade Freemason, you haven't, you haven't even heard of the book Morals and Dogma, which is the Bible of Freemasons, which leads to the Luciferian doctrine. So Albert Pike states that himself. 
can't quote that right now, so I won't do that, but you can look that up in Morals and Dogma, out of Pike, out, out, out of Pike quotes, that um, Satan is their God, doubt is not. You are in the first, second, or third degree, you have no idea about that. Esoteric and exoteric information. And, um, you know, people like Alex Jones, even they don't know it all, or they don't want to know it all. If people like Alex Jones knew it all, they must be very dumb to continue in their agenda that they do. (laughs) And I don't think that these people are very dumb. Because you cannot go on like Alex Jones and ranting on before cameras an hour or two or three without interruption constantly babbling without whether A, being very smart or B, being possessed. And as there are a lot of people who will tell you in the entertainment industry, whether it's Hollywood actors or singers, how they get possessed. And there are a lot of examples. And I, don't, I don't sum them up right now. You can lift it up for yourself. But demon possession is absolutely normal in their circles. I think Alex Jones, when you hear him doing his rants, he is actually possessed. And that means he has willingly totally sold out, sold his soul to the devil. I agree. So the answer is C, all the above. <laughs> But yes, the man is a, an actor slash entertainer, and he's and B, he's demon possessed. Uh, I don't know how you can communicate like a man like like, like that man does without being demon possessed. You know, because the closer I get to the truth, and the closer I get to Christ, the more mellow I actually get. Yeah. And so does everybody else that I talk to. Although you know, you know, you, you know, we're passionate about this subject matter, but I notice. I mean, look, I imagine, ask yourself, you know, uh, you, you know, you're probably a lot more of an aggressive person before you came to the Lord and you came to all this knowledge. I mean, your your energies has been, it's been focused on something different than what it used to be in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. You're not looking for attention from the world anymore. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same old story, you know, and it's, you know, which is interesting. You know, I, I'm reading right now. Um, uh, it's called uh, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer, and it's about Simon Magus. Oh, yeah. yeah he, how, and you know, part of that. It's not, not a story. Have, not part of that story. You're not, you're not reading while I have while I have my rant here, right? Oh no, no. <laughs> this is, I, I, did, I did one last. I did a recording last night, and I'll probably finish up the second half. This evening, if anybody's interested, this evening. Uh, but no, I mean Simon Magus was a demon possessed sorcerer, and we read earlier, you know, and and uh, the end of um, chapter eighteen of Revelations about the sorcery of these men, you know, and what do they use? I mean, what you're watching is sorcery when you watch uh, Alex Jones. It's mind control at its finest. Absolutely. And when you're done with it all, you feel like you. You have learned a little bit of information, and some of it's vital, but most of it's just a twisting of the truth, and you end up fearful, hopeless, no answer, no hope, but you'll never come to the truth as long as you're listening to a man like him. You'll think you will. It will satisfy your pride and your ego. And it is captivating, and absolutely. I mean, I there was a period in my journey in searching for the truth that I spent about, I don't know, about six months. Uh, I don't know if it was six months, but it was maybe two or three months where I just listened to that guy, and I just couldn't, you know, get enough of him. But I finally snapped out of it. Guess who's helped me snap out of him? It was Bill Cooper. <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, did you did you listen to the interview Bill Cooper did with Alex Jones? Yeah, 
I, I don't remember in detail because it was a couple of years ago when I listened to it. But um, well, you can take a look at my YouTube channel, Juggler Sixty Six. I have all five parts of the uh, of the interview uploaded there. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's it's also um, Bill Cooper and Jordan Maxwell. He exposes Jordan Maxwell. Oh yeah, and. Also, you know, in, in, in the same time, he exposes David Icke because Jordan Maxwell says that he is the one responsible for bringing David Icke to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not surprised, are you? It knows. It, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's so obvious. It, it takes a geek to, to, to take another geek, you know? All right. Yeah. It's a wild ride, isn't it? You know, that whole truther oh. movement and what's on the Internet and all the, the layers of the onion that you have to peel back. And, and, and man, you get caught up with like, these guys like uh, Alex Jones or, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the other two gentlemen who just split my mind for some reason. Um, that's obviously Alex Jones, I David Icke, Jordan Maxwell. Yeah. I just I don't uh, pay attention to him anymore. They're Michael Sarian. My... Michael Sarian. No, I spent a lot of time listening to that guy. That guy seemed like he really knew what he was talking about. He really yeah, did, absolutely. didn't he? I agree. And he had, for a time, he had his own website, his own uh, YouTube kind. Uh, uh, it was called Unslave Media. And you could upload videos on there. And uh, it only worked for, I think, a year or something. I had... 70, 80 videos on there, or even more. Everything that I have on YouTube, I put for the security on Unsafe Media, and today Unsafe Media is totally gone. Michael Tarion is a devil worshiper. He's Luciferian, yeah. He's Basically. Luciferian, yeah. He's, and you have this, this other, guy, uh, other guy, this R. Uh, he, he goes by this Italian name. Oh. Santos Bonacci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The astrologer. I listen to the astrology and the pineal gland and the oil and all that stuff, you know, and it's all Luciferian. Isn't it amazing, man? It's, but but it's, it, it was part of the right for me to go with these guys, and that's why I kept videos of them in my playlist sometimes. Like, oh, yeah. also, Eustace Mullins, I, I thought Eustace Mullins was the truth. Wow, I haven't read it. I haven't read his books, of course. But, I thought what the videos that I saw from I was I was so in the work with uh, Eustace Mullins and he was a jealous coadjutor. Huh. I have a very interesting video uploaded from him that is called the Holocaust and the, 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 the Nazi connection. You know we had we had no defense until we came to the Lord and we started reading the Bible. We really had no defense. We're just men of the world, yeah, and absolutely. you know that that's what happens when you live yeah. in the world. You you feel you, know, you feel when you when you come into this truth uh, in, into this truth scene into this alternative media, and you go from here to there, you feel like a ball in a pinball machine. And it's always coming down to its reason, and then being kicked up again, and knocking some point here, and knocking some point there, and knocking some point there, and getting information here, and getting information there. But you're going down means you're digging deep, but then you're being pushed up again by these levels, you know, in a pinball machine, being pushed up again, and always pushed into the same direction. The same direction is, is the Zionists, it's the Jews, it's the Zionists, and it has nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. And only when you see to, when once you have this little chance that you fall between these two things in the pinball machine that can push your ball up, and you fall in between these two, and you fall really down, then you can really duck, starting, digging, into the rabbit hole and see that it's all religious controlled and see that everything in this world has to do with religion. And by that, you have rather the chance to turn to God and accept his truths and measure his truths on everything that you've studied so far and compare it to scripture or to denounce it. Yeah. These are the two possibilities that you have. And some people chose, choose God, and some people do not. They choose the easy way. Because it is easier to live in a lie that you've heard a thousand times than the truth you've heard once. It's true. And it's more convenient. 
It's more convenient. It doesn't shake your belief system. It doesn't shake everything that you believed and everything that you've been raised for. Everything that you've been educated through school, through university, through your job education. Everything that you've shared with your family, with your friends, with your partner. Everything is shaken. Your fundamentals are shaken. When you come to the truth of God, you feel like the World Trade Center Tower collapsing. Everything that you believed and everything that you lived for up to that moment collapses. I mean, that's the way I felt. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, but you know, the, we're fortunate too because we came out of the world. The Lord brought us out of the world. I feel more. I have more empathy and sympathy for those who are still in religion. Who cannot see the truth. But still buy into stuff like, like you said, the Jews, or it's the Muslims, or it's uh, the Zionists, or it's um, this group, that group, and still believe that what's going on in Israel is biblical, or, you know, the endless. They're so deceived, and, and they cannot see it because they believe in Jesus. They're convinced that they believe in Jesus, but they, miss, they don't know the Bible, or what they say they do. They don't. I mean, you just pointed out one verse in, in Luke 21, 24, that anybody just reads that, who's got the spirit of Christ in them, the way, the truth, and the life, is going to look at that and go, wait a minute. There's something not right what's going on in the world, and what people are telling me. God, you know, Christ is the authority, not my pastor or some guy who has a talk show or, um, you know, somebody who's selling a book. Somebody's not right. And I'm putting my bets on that Christ is right and the person is telling me the information is wrong. And when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Bible first, everything starts to fall into place and it all starts to make sense. It's a scary place to be, though, like you said, because yet most of us have to fall pretty hard in this process. Now I come to and understand what true humility is. And humility is not based on the man's tone or their voice or how they present themselves. Humility is the fact that they are teachable, and who's the one that's going to be their teacher? The true teacher, the one who true, either teaches truth, the way and the life, or somebody else's true, you know, concept, philosophy. So, so you know, the irony, irony of irony is you look at like somebody like a Jesuit who demonstrates in the world the way the world sees things is actually quite humble. Men, as, as you said, that it's been you know you pointed out that it's been twenty years educating themselves. It takes a lot of humility to be teachable. Um, but the irony in all that is too is that the true humility that a man needs in order to be saved and to really make any difference, uh, meaningful, lasting difference is to humble themselves to the, what is the complete opposite of what the Jesuits are all about, which is the Bible. Really read the Bible for the first time, using, you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to, to guide you, listening to other people and be able to use discernment, and follow Christ himself. Which then, you know, what happens, as you know, you end up not belonging to a group, you end up belonging to him. And you no longer of any use the Jesuit society, the Society of Jesus, or Rome. And you know what? It doesn't even have to be Rome. It could be all its daughter churches and all its other machinations and creations, whether it's all the political institutions that they've created and movements, and et cetera, you know. So, and uh, what comes down to what I'm seeing, when I see people who have followed Alex Jones, they're really not studying the Bible. They're not really putting their trust in the Lord. Why can I say that? Does it sound judgmental? Maybe, but the truth is I say that because of my own experience and others that I've talked to who have come out of it. They all come to the same conclusion. <laughs> and it wasn't until they surrendered to the Lord in the Bible that anything started to really make sense. So, Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's all right, that's all right. You know, 
we said a lot, a lot of things about Alex Jones that are not so nice and uh, okay because he's not a nice guy. And everything we said about him is the truth as far as we know it. Um, on the other hand, I have to say, a friend of mine, when I was starting uh, questioning what the world is really about, and he told me to go and have a look into 9-11, I started with uh, looking at Alex Jones, and um, I, 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 uh, I subbed his YouTube channel, and uh, I, I went on Prison Planet, and then all the sites that he has, and I watched his movies, and I watched his um, weekly shows as much as I could, mm -hmm. and that helped me to wake up. It all led not to the real truth in the end, that's something that I know right now, but for a starter, it was not bad, I have to say. And that is also why some, uh, some videos that are featuring Alex Jones I still have on my YouTube channel. There's, for example, um, this one movie, it's called um, The Obama Deception. It's from 2008, I think, in the meantime, from Alex Jones. And that movie I still have on my YouTube channel. But I also wrote in the description box that this is very helpful for the waking up, but there's never told the whole truth. Like I have also a movie on my second YouTube channel from Tex Mars, uh, Obama Rothschild's Choice, where I write the same thing. That there's a lot of disinformation in there and that you should always question this Jew thing and see the Jesuit behind them. I write that. But I will give the people the opportunity to see this movie and then do their own research up, upon that. So Alex Jones can be a bad guy. Okay, I give you that. And I'm of the absolute same opinion. We don't have a quarrel about that or a dispute about that. But for someone who comes from nothing, to know nothing, to come in touch with Alex Jones, and by that maybe his light starts to work in his brains, and then he sees for himself that he has to study further on, then um, Alex Jones is a good step in, let's say it like that. Yeah, uh, a, a good I think step, so. A good, a, good, a good part to start with, you know. With, with all the bad things attributed to him, okay, I, I, I give you that, and I'm absolutely of the same opinion. But I still think that if you are if you have never heard anything of the so-called truth and then you found Alex Jones, then at least you will start to get awake by that. In that way, he is helpful, but for nothing else. Well, I, you know, I agree with you, especially for those of us who are starting out, waking up, coming out of the world. And uh, it's those folks that I see where the danger is who are still playing church Christian or churchianity, uh, they go to church on a Sunday, read the Bible a little bit, call themselves Christians, and still are, are focusing and listening to guys like Alex Jones. There's a great danger in that. But what I think what happens is they become extremely confused. I know this only from my own personal experience. And um, we have, you know, I guess what it comes down to, too, is a man has to really want to know the truth. Not that the man, not that that man is true, but the man wants to know what the truth is, has a love for the truth, and eventually, what will happen is you start seeing the contradictions. God will slowly wake you up, lift that veil a little more, and you start to realize what's going on with uh, you know Alex Jones and what's going on with the Bible and other and other areas of life doesn't really gel. I have to make a decision. I got to let go of something. What do I let go of? I had to let go of Alex Jones, and then I moved on to another direction, you know, to somebody else, and then I moved on and moved on until I finally came to a conviction that, you know, either the Bible's real and Jesus is real, or it's not, and nothing's real. <laughs> it's all made up, bunch of crap, and you just pick whatever crap of flavor you want for the day. You know? Yeah, the world is just a hologram. And I am. Yeah. Oh, I think I am. <laughs> yeah. David, I can hear you go. The new age stuff that they put out there. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's right. 
No, that's that, that's absolutely true. What you said, like I said, I I, I think um, Alex Jones can still be uh, helpful for some people, and uh, or Arctic Mars or David Icke or whatever, just to wake up. But just they have to see that that is not the street they have to go for the whole time. I mean, that took a long way with me also because it took me 47 years to wake up. So. Yeah, me too. I mean, I'm I'm 46. Not like I, you know. Uh, no, but, but but you were you were quite um, religiously raised with your Mormon background and everything, so that was maybe not the real religious background that you wanted. But but you were raised Mormon, and then you were always involved with the church from the child on, right? Uh, no, I mean I I went on a mission, and after that I left the church in my early twenties. So. And uh, I joined the as it was eight, and, and as far as the church goes, actually, my experience from Mormonism really uh, gave me a foul taste of religion. In fact, I, I hated religion and pretty much became an atheist, so I didn't want anything to do with religion. That's the same with me, even though I was not a practicing Protestant or a, Protestant or a practicing Catholic or whatever. I mean, I was raised Protestant, if anything, my mother was Protestant, but I never saw the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism. Because when we went to church, we also got the Jesus cookie. Uh, and then and, and I don't understand where the difference is. And when I asked somebody, okay, where's the difference between, um, uh, between Catholicism and Protestantism, nobody could explain it to me in the way that I understood it. Right. So when I had this confirmation that's one of the sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church, you have the same in the Protestant Church, I was 14 years or something, I just did that because my friends did that, and, and they said they did that because they got money from their right. family. Hey, I had a small, a small family, I needed money, so I said, oh, I'm going to do the same stuff. They were, Therefore, you have to go to church. Well, I don't care where I sit, I go to church, okay, I don't care. Yeah. Uh, I sat there, I prayed, I, I sang, I didn't care what I did because I didn't believe in all that, you know? It was all a hoax to me. When I, I, guess when I got baptized, when I got baptized in the in the church, when I was 14 years old or something, that was a day that I went on to play with my friends, and we were doing a military exercise game, and I had military pants and military boots and a military shirt on, and I walked <laughs> like that into the church, got sprinkled water on my head, and went out there right away because otherwise I couldn't catch my train to Friedrichsruhe outside in Germany where we were going and we were having this military maneuver playing, you know? That was the kind of commitment that I had to the church when I was young. <laughs> I think a lot camouflage, of Camouflage trouser, shirt, and military boots. That's the way I went to church for my baptism. Right. <laughs> and you can you can't make stuff like this. Up. That's no, really you happy. can't. You can ask my mother. It's really true. She says she's still appalled about that. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, as far as me in my childhood, I would have to give credit credits to. Um, I'm sure that if the concept and the idea of Christ in the Bible was not shared to me as a, as a young man or as a child, um, that I. Uh, there's a good possibility that I would not, you know, 20 some years later come back to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, that you may be, you know, to try it one more time and try to understand it. You know, who is Jesus Christ for the first time? Maybe we really study the Bible and try to understand it, you know? And not just do it, you know, and I had to fight really hard not to join any group because that's a natural response that many of us do when we first come to the Lord, we think that we need to go join a, a religion because everyone tells us you have to. Um, but I'm so grateful now that I haven't done that. Because that's, yeah, another, that's another th problem with joining a group, a religious organization, oh, a man-made religion. It, it clouds your judgment and it keeps you from asking, going far enough and falling in love with the Lord, the way, the truth, and the life. And what happens is you just end up being boxed in by the, whatever religious organization you're in, and you never, that's what happens to many Christians, you never come to the realizations that you and I have come to realize, because we have not been bound down by religious creeds and dogmas and doctrines. We don't have an affiliation with any organization. We just want to know the truth, and it will inevitably lead to this conversation that we had today about the Jesuits. <laughs> okay, Michael, I'm going to continue reading.
Okay. On the article from the unearthed mind. Um, okay. Okay. No, no. Okay. <clears throat> Same as how Harold, uh, Carol Quigley focuses on the Anglo-American but forgets conveniently his whorehouse, Georgetown Military Fortress University, and the Jesuits. Just another Jesuit diversion to keep you from sniffing at the Roman power in plain sight. Just like Lyndon LaRouche promoting the wicked, vile Roosevelt of the opium-smuggling connected clique of the worshipful company of the apothecaries and how he was Knight of Malta connected vermin. The only true American president at the end was Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln and, of course, U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Lyndon LaRouche, of course, has connections to both French masonry and Scottish Rite with his KKK connection. The entire conspiracy arena was set up to control the awakening flock, and this was started by Jesuit soldier Frederick Coppelson, Society of Jesus. Uh, are you aware of uh, Lyndon LaRouche? No, I think, when you, when you don't answer. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche is very popular here in Europe because he always talks about um, changing the money system back to, um, what was it there? Um, oh, oh, that was an act they did there. Uh, was it in 1944, 1945? Um, I don't know, especially when, uh, when, when they took away the gold standard. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche is uh, very popular here in Europe and uh, I followed him at the time. Um, and, and until I saw through his agenda, so it's very interesting that Lyndon LaRouche is mentioned here on the on the article that I'm just reading. Here. So uh, when you don't know Lyndon LaRouche, uh, take a look at him. Uh, was it uh, Britain? Uh, oh, what was this? Oh, you know when I have something on the tip of my tongue and I can't come to it, it's uh, really hurting me. <laughs> Bretton Woods. That's the agreement that I meant that he was talking about. Bretton Woods. <clears throat> okay, continue reading. Amazing is it not that people can try to make out that ancient orders which are still in existence today have become irrelevant. All the time they are mention, mentioning other ancient orders as some kind of gods simply because they have been destroyed. The Order of Malta, for example, is older than the Knights Templar fought in mighty battles all the same and continue to this day, veiled, of course, as a mere charity aiding tax avoidance. <clears throat> they took the Templar wealth and power in 1312 with papal bull at providam. Today they are shielded, veiled, and ignored, all whilst the command, while they command the military, the fuelers, pharmaceutical, apothecaries, industrial, world traders, educational, haberdashers, complex for the Jesuit order, who subordinated the Order of Malta in 1798. Aha, that's the year that General Berthier arrested the Pope in Rome and afflicted the almost deadly wound to the Vatican system. Through Switzerland and the library company system of the City of London Corporation based at New Jerusalem, one look at the Central Intelligence Agency and you can see the extent of the power of the Knights of Malta. But no, today the agents of deception, such as Jim Condor Jr., will make you think they are suddenly irrelevant, when in fact they are one of the seven most powerful groups on earth. Amazing, is it not? The other powers are Jesuit Order, Vatican, the Christian Order of the Holy Sepulchre of Jerusalem, Sacred Military Constantinian Order of St. George, Opus Dei, and the City of London Corporation. Emperor Juan Carlos, being in all of these papal orders and over the New Jerusalem since 1975. When you are talking finance, you have to understand its highest powers in our, our sepulchre, Order of Malta and Opus Dei. By the way, uh, Juan Carlos retreated uh, as King of Spain this year, I think, and his son took over after all these years. The Jesuit order itself is nearly 500 years old and has destroyed popes, kings, princes, governments, and politicians. Today, the Jesuits are now suddenly ignored. How convenient for the Council of Trent. The same as how today you are taught history just happens, whereas years ago you were taught history was, a well uh, was all a conspiracy where people were conspiring. The same as today 
that class anything over 30 years old as ancient history is a wonder the dumbed down flock then cannot grasp ancient order knowledge with their lacking intelligence and common sense skills destroyed <clears throat> today part through the linguistic minimalism agenda all run uh, all dumped down of course by the worship company and haberdashers mercers running the education system of the world from new jerusalem with the addition of the company of educators not forgetting the old true definition of jesuit being a clever person who deceives the people another diversion today is how they try to hide the fact of the jesuit secret oath of the fourth vow well, something we talked about earlier here, right? Remember, that's why it's still very important to go through the fourth law of the Jesuits. Even though the secret oath is on U.S. congressional record, they still try to claim it's faked. Does that not remind you of their attempt to claim the leaked Iron Mountain report was fake? If you don't know Iron Mountain, the video is on my YouTube channel, Dr. 66. You can watch the documentary there, almost two hours. They have come unstuck since all, uh, since as all that was in the report has come out and is coming true to this very day. These critters rely on the brainwashing by the trendsetter, the Tavistock Institute for Human Re Relations and its sister branch run by the Stanford Research Institute or the Deutsche Verteidigungsdienst, German Defense Service. Tavistock being the mind-bending controller using over 500 years of naval intelligence experience. By the way, if you didn't understand the word critères, I was reading in the sentence here before. I'm sorry to say that in English, but critères is French for asshole. The Jesuit order is the most feared order on earth, and this will never change and has not for hundreds of years. The order has roots back to the ancient Crusades, the same as the Order of Malta, except with the name changes and suppressions along the way. When Emperor Juan Carlos says jump, everyone in the Rothschilds urinates himself and jumps to attention to the House of Bourbon Roman Empire, which is subordinate only to the temporal power and the Curia Generalitia priesthood, which the Bourbons protect through the Spanish National Intelligence Center. You should notice the Rome-born emperor has his main dwelling at Piazza di Spagna at Villa Medici in Villa Borghese, right next to the powerful propaganda Fide controlling all the Vatican lands worldwide. This is, uh, this is the second power of the Vatican, and some say a greater power than the one you would imagine. You want to ignore the greatest merchants on earth, the Order of Malta, the Amalfi, and the most powerful priesthoods feel free, but it is extremely foolish. These agents of deception will help you in Gaga land, never getting to the core of anything and spinning on that useless gerbil wheel <clears throat> all day long with no destination, just large muscles, legs, muscled legs in an invisible cage. The heart and kidneys of this conspiracy is the Jesuit order and their papal orders. You will note our temporal coadjutors twist information presented by ourselves just to suit their little diversion agenda. The Sabbatean Frankists came about in the middle 17th century, not 20 centuries ago. The Vatican has controlled the Talmudic labor Zionists outright, no ifs or buts, since the 17th century. And the splitting of the Jews, the Sanhedrin said, we have no king but Caesar. These agents like to ignore the power of the Roman Empire, which is the roots of the Vatican today. Study the Roman Empire and then think very carefully. The Caesar became the Pope and the Senate became the College of Red Cardinals. Today, Washington, D.C. is modeled after the Roman Empire command. Nothing more than the continuation of the Mitra Solar religion with the Pope being the door to the son of Horus and his cardinals being his hinges. For now, the Pope is seen as Osiris, but when the final Pope is slain and risen, he has finally symbolically become Horus in the time for the new world religion, age of Aquarius, Ion of Horus, with the full power over the entire earth. The atheists will then be mind reframed once again back into the new worship of Lucifer since their last job was completed in aiding the destruction of all religions 
along with Jesuit infiltration of all churches through their infiltration training as pointed out by Hiram Dukes and others, not forgetting the demonic charismatic movement and the destruction of Christianity which can be witnessed in Tex Mars exposure on the fake Christian, uh, Christians up to their trickery. Welcome to the Jesuit New World Order. May its soldiers and co us rot in hell. To be a true Christian, one has to hold a Puritan, true Christian Bible, being the Geneva Bible, which has been banned and has, been, and has never entered a Templar Freemasonic Lodge. The King James Bible was pirated by the New Jerusalem ancient pirates using a cultic Enochian magic master, Sir John Dee, of the Worshipful Company of Mercers. So when you see temporal coadjutor Jordan Maxwell, a.k.a. Russell Pine, attack the astronomy and the cult areas of the King James Bible, you can now understand why and how it too is not true Christianity and how it is yet another tool for the eventual destruction of the true Christianity into the age of Aquarius or the Aeon of Horus. Something which the likes of Maxwell and Ike can harp onto now to aid the agents of pushing people into the New Age movement, which was mastered by Jesuit soldier Pierre Teller de Chardin. End of the reading of the article. Well, I have never read the last article, because otherwise I would have maybe directly made a little note on this King James Bible. Um, I saw enough videos from uh, Walter Feitz to explain how the King James Bible is the only trustable Bible in English. On the other hand, I also like the Geneva um, 1599 version, and you can look that one up. And um, I always said um, that it is nice to compare the two Bibles, the Geneva and the um, King James Bible. So when you can put them both uh, side by side, you can compare them and you will see the differences are uh, not so much, but of course there is something that also entered uh, the uh, King James Bible, um, which according to uh, my uh, dear friend uh, Wayne Michael, Wayne Michaels is um, uh, taken out of Egypt, and that is of course the word Amen, that is not only in the King James Bible, that is in every Bible that uh, that we have, but that actually comes from Amen Ra from Egypt. And when you read the King James, the first time the word Amen appears is in Exodus. Exodus is when the Israelites are taken out of Egypt. So it is quite possible that they took that out of Egypt. And uh, anyway, there's an interesting uh, article about how do you end your prayers on the website Avenue of Light from Wayne Michael. And um, I invite everybody to read that and to study that and to see if you can agree or uh, do not agree with it. But I think he somewhere has a point there um, where this word Amen, uh, as comes from Amen Ra from Egypt, comes from and why should that end the prayer to my Heavenly Father. Uh, when I end my prayer to my Heavenly Father, I, I say whether thank you, Father, or so be it. And then I think he knows what is meant. So I don't need any other words for that. Whew. That's been quite a reading. Yeah, I would say. I know I've never read the Geneva Bible yet, so I don't know what the difference, what significant differences are, but it makes you wonder. So. Makes you, makes well, the Geneva sense. Bible is, is also mainly based on uh, Tyndale, Tyndale's writing and Wycliffe's writing. Uh -huh. uh, and Huss took them, took, their, took, took that with him to Geneva, I think, uh, and, and that was protected or, or written in the end. And then you have this um, uh, publication from the Geneva Bible of 1599, and you can find that one online. All right. If you can find it. I have, I have a link here. I can, I can send you the link via Skype, and uh, you can find them and you can read that uh, that Bible online. Right. You know, the other thing, too, about John D. and his involvement in the King James Bible, I haven't really been able to find anything to authenticate. authenticate mm -hmm. that. So I don't know if that's true or not, or if it's just a fable. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mentioned the video that I saw of uh, about the fight explaining how the King James Bible is the only acceptable uh, English-spoken Bible in the real world of God. Um, there's a video that you can look up on YouTube by the way, it's called uh, Battle of the Bibles. 
And then he has two other videos, and that is called Changing the Words, Part 1 and Part 2. So in total, you have about uh, four to six hours video where he explains um, the basis for the Bibles. For example, the Catholic Bible, of course, is based on Alexandrian script, and the King James Bible is based on Antioch script. And uh, the King James is based not on... Um, on the Alexandrian, because Alexandria, where is that? In Egypt, and what comes out of Egypt? Well, the same, same shit that comes out of Rome, of course. Antioch is, uh, is, is Greek, I think. Um, and uh, the King James is uh, for 70% based on uh, Tyndale. And uh, the Geneva Bible is also, for the most part, uh, based on Tyndale. So the differences between the Geneva Bible and the King James Bible are, as far as I think, not too far away. And, I mean, I read the King James. I even bought the King James uh, online and uh, got it sent here to me. And uh, I read it as a book and I read it online. And I love the King James Bible and I don't know where there are any, any mistakes in there. So I say take this last paragraph that I read uh, to be a true Christian one who has to hold a pure uh, true Christian Bible, saying being the Geneva Bible, uh, we can, in, in my case, you can uh, translate it also with the King James. I don't think that the King James Bible is in that way corrupted that it is not the true will of God. But I don't want to go into discussion with that because I haven't studied that uh, too much. But I'm quite sure that um, the Geneva Bible still is an excellent, uh, the, the King James is still an excellent Bible for English speaking persons. And exactly when I uh, take the King James and I translate parts into German, and um, then I take my Lutheran Bible that I have here, then I see a lot of changes uh, in the Lutheran Bible, not in the King James. So the King James is more original than the Lutheran Bible that I have. So Interesting. You know, and then we got the, this is a side note, the New American Bible which is a Jesuit creation. Yeah, and you have the NIV <laughs> and the new standard ver NSV, and then I don't know, all these all these versions, and uh, every, every, uh, every day there comes out a new version of the Bible, you know. Uh, no, it is, uh, you, have to, you have to really stick to... Uh, and I know the Jesuit... Sola Scriptura, Sola Scriptura, yeah. and this is the, the original Hebrew, the original Hebrew and uh, Greek writing, Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. Yeah, and that's uh, and the basis for that is uh, the King James version. Uh, and I watched a video on the, about uh, how this uh, King James version was made. You know, he had a real King James had a real committee of four or five different groups, and in every group there were so and so many scholars, and they were doing that for I think four or five years. Uh, I mean, the first the first Bible that you could read in English. I don't know if you know that, but that's the one from Tyndale. And yeah. Tyndale, uh, in that time, um, the, the, new, uh, the New English Bible, it was called, uh, or the English Bible, it was called, that was actually a translation from Latin. So that was not from the original manuscript, but that was a translation from the Latin Bible that was used in the Roman Catholic Church. Um, to English, and that was, you know, when uh, when Tyndale was burned at the stake in 1536, I think it was. Um, he was uh, strangled and then uh, and then burned alive on the stake, and it is said that the last thing that he cried out on the stake was, "Oh Lord, open the eyes of the King of England." Right. And the year after that, uh, Henry VIII. Uh, published the uh, first English Bible in uh, uh, the first Bible in English, and that was the translation that in the main, and that was uh, from uh, from Latin. Uh, I see we have a question here uh, about how does Switzerland connect with the Jesuits? Well, that is a very interesting question, and we have had uh, Sean Ross from uh, the YouTube channel Gire and Chatsifrats. Uh, an original South African who's been living for more than 20 years in Switzerland right now on that. And he was dealing with that. I myself have not gone too deep into 
uh, the collections, but I can tell you a few things that may be interesting if you haven't uh, known that. First of all, Switzerland was founded by the Knights Templars. The Jesuits are the revived Knights Templars. Right. In Zurich, which is the capital of Switzerland, you have the, a bank that is called the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements. That bank is the mother of all central banks worldwide. So you have, in every country, you have your central bank, like in the United States of America, you have your Federal Reserve. Here in Europe, we have the European Central Bank, but in all the other countries, we have here the Belgian Central Bank, we have the German Bundesbank, uh, we have the Switzer Bundes, Schweizer Bundesbank, or, uh, Österreichische Bundesbank, so every country has its own Bundesbank, Central Bank. And the mother bank, the central bank of all these central banks, is the Bank of International Settlements. That is in Switzerland, in Zurich, and owned by the Rothschild family. <laughs> Who there are, which we have learned tonight, yeah. the guardians of the Vatican treasure and being knights of Malta, being Jesuit controlled. So where is the connection to Switzerland and the Jesuits? I think that is kind of obvious at that point. But our friend Sean does go into much deeper research about uh, bloodlines of the pharaohs and he connects these pharaohs there with, and he really goes into the bloodline connection of the um, of the English um, of the English queen and the, the English English monarchy and all that. And um, he he connects it also to uh, uh, symbolism. I mean, when you go into Switzerland, there you see one obelisk after another obelisk uh, that is sun worship coming out of Egypt. Egypt is of course pharaoh, but Egypt is also Isis, Horus, and Thess, IHS, which is the initials in the Jesuit emblem. Okay. I mean, how deep can you go? How much can you say about these things? You really, you really, if, if you want to know what is the connection between Switzerland and the Jesuits, and, and another in, interesting point is why are the Swiss guard the guards of the Pope? And why are there many neutral countries, like, for example, in the First World War and the Second World War, Belgium was neutral, the Netherlands were neutral, but they were both invaded by Germany. Switzerland was neutral, always was neutral, and was never invaded by Germany. Hmm. Austria was abducted by Hitler in 1938, brought back into the Reich, Heimens Reich, ein Land, ein Reich, ein Führer, <laughs> and <laughs> I like to speak German sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Switzerland was not uh, taken taken in there, you know. So when Austria was observed by Germany and put back into the Reich, nobody did that with Switzerland. And in Switzerland, you have a German speaking part, you have a French speaking part, and you have an Italian speaking part. So right. why Switzerland always? Um, neutral and other neutral countries like Belgium, they said they were neutral and didn't, didn't help them. They got invaded. I don't know. but I get, I get the distinct impression that actually Vatican runs with Switzerland. Now that... Yeah, well, in particular... Yeah, but in particular, it's, you know, we look at Switzerland being a neutral country during these wars that the Vatican or the Jesuits created themselves, looking at the banking industry and how the, you know, the largest bank in the world and where all the Vatican's gold is, is in Switzerland. Um, it just goes on and on and on. You just realize that the Vatican, um, whether it's officially out in the public, declaring it is one thing, but if you look at their actions, where the gold is, where their wealth is, where the Swiss guard is, uh, the banking situation, how Switzerland was so much involved in the creation of the Nazi party, on and on and on, you get to a point, you just look how many Jesuits came out of Switzerland. <laughs> um, you can only, you know, come to one conclusion, basically, 
that... Of course, if you if you consider that Switzerland was founded by the Knights Templars and yeah. the Jesuits are the revived Knights Templars, there you have your connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How, how deep does that go? I mean, I think, I think personally, all the gold in the world is not in Fort Knox, is not in the Federal Reserve of New York. All the gold in the world is in Switzerland. I agree too. Hidden, hidden in the mountains. And they never send it over to China like other folks are trying to tell us in the past couple of years that China yeah, is China buying China up all the gold. gold. That many gold, oh, come on. Rome's not going to give up his gold. It doesn't give up his gold. It never has given up his gold, and it's certainly not going to send it over to China. Like, like with the gold price, the gold price is, um, uh, is set by uh, people like the Rothschilds who control international banking at the oil price and everything. There's no free market of these stuff. Of those stuff, so no, um, that, that's all controlled, you know. But the point is, um, you want the Jesuit connection to Switzerland. Well, Jesuits are the revived Knights Templars, the Knights Templars founded Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland is a brothership. Uh, we, we should go into that maybe with Sean. Uh, Switzerland has the international abbreviation CH, that's the uh, HC, that stands for Helvetica. Uh, and, and something else, Helvetica, that, that comes from Greeks, from Greece, yeah. I think. So um, this is really something you have to dig deep into, and I cannot go into that subject right now because I don't have the background. I say that honestly when I don't know anything about I tell you. I, I tell you the connections that you can make that I make here and say, okay, go and research that. But I don't have all the answers. No, uh, there's so many. But yeah, one thing I saw, Sean Ross, his last name is spelled H R R O S S. Yeah, he's you know having a very hard time right now, folks. And you know he shared with us, and you know, he's in prison right now. He could need our he could need our prayers. Yeah, he could really use our prayers. So remember that. We got another question, by the way. Mm-hmm. Question number two is: Can you ask this guy who he thinks is behind the worldwide? Demonic, demonic, excuse me, organized gang stalking program. Well, if you're asking me, I have to tell you that I am not aware of a demonic organized gang stalking program. I have not information about that. I have heard about that. Um, stalking is, um, is kind of a new word, but it's actually an old thing, you know. Um, yeah. Um, this it is it is always to focus on on, on somebody and um, uh, to discredit that person uh, and to put fear into that person. So when you are um, thinking that there is a worldwide demonic, uh, demonic organized gang stalking program. Well, then you are not wrong because the devil and all the demons are after every soul that searches the truth, that loves Jesus Christ. And that I would call a worldwide demonic, a demonic organized gang-stalking program because they want our souls. Nothing more and nothing less. How do they do that in practice? That's something else. That you have probably some people that you can... Uh, encounter in your workspace. There you have probably some people that you can encounter uh, when your family, uh, within your family, within your friendship circle, whatever. You can encounter these people probably everywhere because, um, like the question is raised, demonic organized. Well, you know, I'm not the devil. I do not organize demons, but I am very well aware of it that he does, but I don't know how, and I can tell you I'm quite sure that these things exist. So uh, I am not very um, firm on the subject on worldwide demonic organized gang stalking programs, so I can't say very much about this, but except for the things that I just said, and this is the things that I believe in. Uh, Okay. You know, the people who are standing for the truth and are trying to spreading the truth have always been stalked. Started with Jesus. 
Hmm. You're still there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Still there. Yeah. You know, well, here's my take on things, too. So, well, first of all, I guess Evan, I don't know who you are exact, exactly, but um, uh, on talk, talk, who we used to on talk to you, on talk to you, they have several. Um, several shows that deal with that, with gang stalking. Maybe you're part of that group. I don't know. Um, uh, we also had um, Keith uh, Keith uh, Hampshire from Uncontrolled Opposition. He has a website that talks about that. But, you know, looking at this, when you look at worldwide dynamic, demonic organized gang stalking programs, this is how, this is my take on it. Although you didn't ask me, I'm going to bring my 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 two cents into this. If we look at the brown shirts and the black shirts, the brown shirts is in Germany, Nazi Germany, the black shirts in Italy, we look at the the Catholics in actions, all these fifth column groups that are found throughout, uh, you know, when we first started hearing about them more publicly at least, at least that I recognize, maybe sooner than that, but the, the, the first world wars, particularly the second world war, we have that same Thing going on in this country today, they don't talk about it. They don't. A lot of folks don't connect the dots and realize that the Jesuit or the Catholic connection to gang stalking. But we look at that. We look a little, study a little bit of history and how they, let's say, the Nazis used the brown shirts when they first started getting organized. They started to, to terrorize the general public. You know, we hear about the stuff where they did, where they, they committed, you know, they killed folks and they rounded up, you know, the opposition, the political opposition. But at the same time, they were also doing other things to the general public and just generally just harassing folks, keeping people from actually having free speech, uh, freedom of thought and expression. Now, today we're dealing with a different situation with this, with the new technology and the use of um you know, cell to- cellular towers and waves and you know microwaves and everything else is going on. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it. I my argument is that it is going on. I've heard too many people talk to me about it and, and, and describe too many situations that fall along with it that it, it is going on. I also argue that the only defense that there really is is to having a personal relationship with God and reading the Bible uh, on a daily basis and there is no other answer to this what's going to happen and it's going to ramp up it's going to get worse um, as far as it being uh, demonic absolutely you know what I mean, you only have two choices in this world whether you believe it or not either the Lord or either God's spirits with you or somebody else's spirits with you you don't get a choice and it beyond that. So you make your choice. We all have to make our choice. And a lot of folks are not going to make their make the right choice. They're not going to follow Jesus Christ. They're going to follow their own will, whims, their own desires, or false religions like Roman Catholicism and the multitude of other ones. And that makes them ripe candidates for demon possession. And you have to ask yourself something. People in these groups that walk around and and, you know, It'll do like was it? It's called that knockout thing where they go around and they punch people just out of the blue to start beating up somebody. You know? Do you think that's the spirit of God in them? You know? Uh, I don't think so. And if you look at all the other different things that go on, um, so who is behind the worldwide? Now, this this was the importance of this question because he says worldwide. Now, what organization is capable? of having anything like a worldwide organized program. What do you think that would be? I'm asking you, York, if you're still there. <laughs> yeah, I, understand, I understand that you asked me, but that's, that's the point that I was making, that it's all from, it com, comes over from the Jesuits. Yeah, because for Rome, it's always been. <laughs> yeah, all, all, reads, all, all, roads, all roads lead to Rome. I don't know if I said that in the broadcast or if I said that in the private conversation, I'm going to gladly repeat it right here. There are a lot of people who say all roads lead to Rome. Yeah, okay, that's a given. All roads lead to Rome. But do you know why all roads lead to Rome? Because Rome built all the roads in the first place. 
Rome was 2,000, 2,500 years ago, the civilization that we had that conquered the world, that conquered Europe. And to conquer Europe, they had to move troops. And troops walk better on the road than through the wilderness. 2,000 years ago and today, still the same. On the road, you walk easily. So Rome built the roads for their troops to move and for the supplies that had to move after the troops. And it's still the same today. Do you think Adolf Hitler built the Autobahn, the German highway system, because the few Volkswagens that run on there? No, he built the Autobahn for the troops to move, for the tanks and everything to get moving. That was the reason of the Autobahn. And that's the same for the highway system you have in the United States of America. You're going to wake up there when you're in the fourth right and you will see them. And then you will see what your highways are for. Well, the ones they maintain. The ones they don't maintain, they are for the lay people. But the, way they, the, the ones they maintain, they need for troops moving. And then it's the same in every country. All roads lead to Rome because Rome built the roads. Simple as that. Rome was the only one who needed roads. People who were living in the country, they didn't need any roads. Why, Why did they need it for? They were self-sufficient with their, with their food and everything. They had the neighbors and exchanged that. And they didn't, know, they didn't need any roads. They didn't need any big cities. But that's Rome. That's the extension of Rome. Yeah. And, you know, there's this thing, when, if, if one can accept the truth, it's not a premise or some, my opinion, it's the truth. We live in a Roman Catholic country created by the Jesuits. They control all aspects. Let me, let me explain. When I say they control all aspects of our lives, that means they control the media. They control the Internet. They control the military. They control the government. They control big business. They control the banking. If I missed it, they control religion. They control all of it. At the top, you're going to find Jesuits. You're going to find Roman Catholics. I know that's a bold statement. I challenge you to go up there and prove me wrong, because you're going to find out it's actually the truth. Uh, they started, you know, if you look at the United States government, you know, we got a vice president. He's a Jesuit. And we got yeah, a yeah, boner, yeah. boner for the Republican Party on the other side who's a Jesuit. Yeah, yeah. We, got, we, got, we got Obama who was Jesuitly trained and... And, and who had a degree from Notre Dame. Yeah. And he's a Jesuit uh, high school. He's a Jesuit, they call him a Jesuit Marxist, who plays the role of a quote unquote you know Muslim if you will I mean a lot of folks want to say he's a Muslim you know what I mean no his first and foremost allegiance is not to the Muslim faith it's actually to Rome so when we look at all these things that are happening in our society and I'm talking about United States of America now because I can't speak for your society but I imagine it's not too much different <laughs> um, uh, since Rome controls that place too um is the fact that they control all your as- all the aspects of your life. So whatever's going on in the Internet, whatever's going on, you know, especially when talking about mainstream now, the yeah, fact is Rome is allowing this show to be happening. In fact, they're paying attention to this show. You know, this small, rinky-dinky show, am I worried about it? Not at all. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's a society that we live in. Should I be fearful about it? I have trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Bible. I don't have to worry about the fact Whatever happens, happens. Regardless, I you know, I leave it in God's hands. I don't fear them. Well, but, you the, know, solution, the solution for our lives is not in this world, but in the world of Jesus Christ. So I don't care what happens here and the NSA and Jesuits and all this stuff. They can listen into the show as much as they want to. I speak my heart. I speak my truth as long as I can. Simple as that. Yeah, we were trying to serve Jesus and. Let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, like you said, you know, our hope is not in this life anyways. And that, that don't get us wrong. I mean, at least for me, I, I don't have any death wish. I don't feel like dying. I hope I can live up to a ripe age. 
I have old age. I really do. And most people say, what? I really, I really do. <laughs> I don't particularly want to die. I want to, I have loved ones in my life and I want to see them grow and prosper and do all that. And I want to see it. But, um, whatever the course may be, the course may be. So, but yeah, it really does happen. There really is something going on. I think a big part of what happens. Now let me go back to this worldwide demonic organized organized uh, gang stalking program. I really blue believe a big part of it is the alternative media. I do believe a part of it is people like Alex Jones, whose true role is to confuse you and to bring a whole bunch of fear upon you. If you uh, have, I just want to say fear-mongering is the word that you are looking yeah. for with Alex Jones. Fear-mongering, yeah. And, and, and when you live in fear, you can't think straight. And when you can't think straight, you turn to anybody who tells you something. You turn to him, you turn to the government. That's why communism works so easily. Everybody is the same. Everybody is the same, except for the people on the top. You know, there's a, there's did, a did you, spiritual did you, aspect did as you, well. Did you, ever, did you ever watch the movie or read the book Animal Farm from George Orwell? Oh, yeah, I've read it several times, actually. All, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Yeah. That is all, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... But, you know, there's, uh, there's a spiritual aspect of that, too, because if you're not close to the Word of God, you're not close to Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit's not guiding you, something else is going to guide you. And when this now this where this the demon uh, whole idea comes in, where you end up becoming, quote-unquote, possessed, and it can be manifest in, in horrendous ways... But for many of us, it's simply just driven all life with fear and worry and confusion and how the next day am I going to get anywhere in life? You know, what is going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? Oh, my gosh, what's going to happen to my You know, all this stuff. You know, people aren't loving me anymore. Because people seem all strange and all that. You know, and then you end up becoming, in a, in a way, possessed by these dark forces, which we call demons these fallen angels, and they have a, a room in you. They have a chance to, to actually control you. Yes. And a lot of people say, well, I don't buy that. I don't believe that. All I can say is prove me wrong by trying what I just said. It has a lot, of, uh, it has a, it has a lot to do with people are always trying to please other people Yeah. instead of trying to please God. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. I'm sorry to bring it down to this little point, but you know, <coughs> when you are when you are listening to, like, what Guest 7 here just writes, Alex Jones is the king of fear-mongering. Uh, absolutely right. Alex Jones is, I don't know, the king of, but he is ex- uh, he's certainly one of the biggest fear-mongers out there in the mainstream, me- in, in, in the alternative media. But on the other hand, don't forget about the mainstream media. How many fear-mongering are they with their rumors of wars with their Ebola hoax, with their HIV hoax, with their NHN1 uh, swine flu, I don't know, all these hoax. Oh, yeah, the man. mainstream media is nothing but fear-mongering also. Look at Ukraine and the stuff they are doing right now. Uh, look at the situation that arises in Syria for the last uh, three or four years there with their agenda that they are having. The mainstream media is fear-mongering as much as the alternative media. Oh, yeah, well, look at, look at the so channel. I, I, I wouldn't say that Alex Jones is the king of fear-mongering, but he, is, uh, he certainly uh, shares the throne, uh, I'm, I'm quite sure, whether it's in, uh, in, in the alternative media or in the mainstream media, but never forget the mainstream media, and that is what keeps the sheeple in dark. That's what keeps the sheeple in their way. And every way, every morning, again, getting up, going into the hamster wheel, producing taxes for the state, uh, thinking they are free, and in the evening coming home and watching a stupid uh, Hollywood television series to get their minds off all the things that they have been thinking all day about and not finding the way to God and splitting up the family by destroying the communication with this television that they have, the television set that they have at their home. And people focus on that instead of on their partner having conversations with their, uh, with their mother, with their father, with their wife, with their son, with their daughter, with their brother, with their sister, with their friends, um, reading the Bible, studying, reading books, not for entertainment, but reading books to get knowledge. This is everything taken away in, in this fear-mongering system that we live in. And then you have this constant stress that is put on you, and that stress leads to illnesses, and that leads to cancer. 
and that leads to all other kinds of illnesses, which you can see come from very often psychological problems because a lot of people are so deranged, they don't even get it, they don't even know why they are here right now. They don't know yeah. what life is all about. And when you do not know Jesus, you will never know what life is about. I'm sorry, but it's simple as that. You can take that to the bank because it's all about Jesus. Yeah, and by the way, with also with this organized gang stuff, you'd be amazed how much the, the connection with Roman Catholicism is, how many of these folks are under. So I think something happens to folks too who are, who stay in Roman Catholicism. Almost like a demon possession happens to them, which makes sense. I know it seems arrogant, or you know, that I'm being a bigot now. But if you look at what the, the or what Roman Catholicism actually is, at its core, being Luciferian. You know, the goim, like they call the rest of us, gets this veneer, this false doctrine of Jesus Christ. Not the true doctrine of Jesus Christ, but they still talk about Jesus Christ. And they say, this is about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But they don't teach the Ten Commandments. It's their own version of the Ten Commandments. It's their, the, the whole, it's, it's like the papacy, the Jesuits are all at enmity with the Bible of Jesus Christ. So when you're in that organization, that's why Jesus wants you to come out. Now it talks about we read in, in Revelation 18 about these uh, these plagues that, will, that are going to come upon those who stay in these organizations, these curses, and part of those curses, I argue, and stay, uh, by staying into these uh, like Roman Catholic Church and affiliate organizations and their networks of things that they do, the different organizations. It allows you to be infected. It allows you to be cursed. It allows you to be plagued. And a lot of that is, becomes now this emotional, psychological torment that people are going through now because there's of where they're still at right now, where they're st- what they're still holding on to. I mean, there really is people walking around the streets right now that are gangs that are, that are, are organized. If you look what's going on in Ferguson, it's a blatant video after video of Jesuit priests involved in the middle of these groups of you know, these um, videos that you see of them, but their protests and everything, it's all orchestrated. It's all mind control. If you look at the, the television, there's a reason why they call them channels. What channel are you watching? Because when we originally created television, it was a military weapon. It was designed not only for mind control, but when they first were creating it, they were looking into how they could channel, of all things, demon, demon possession, how they could channel to the other side. I know it sounds crazy, but if you do just a little bit of research, you're going to find out that what I just said is true. And, you know, what do you do about that? You know, you have to reduce the amount of opportunities for you to be basically mind controlled. By this or by, by all the Jesuits, so that means you got to turn off the television. You got to turn off the radio that's in your car. And all the you got to turn off all the you know the uh, the music. A lot of the music that you're listening to. Yeah, put the show on a USB stick and listen to that in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you know you know learn the truth for once, accept it and, and embrace it. You know because um, that's where your only defense is going to be. I know it's not a satisfactory answer because it's not in line with what the world says to do. But I can tell you from my own experience, because I've had an experience of myself of this gang stalking thing, and um, I've come to realize that the only answer, the only way, I'm, I'm not being trite here. I'm not just trying to, you know, give you a band-aid to a gaping wound. The, uh, the only thing that worked for me, at least, and it was a lot of prayers. A lot of prayers, and at night, you know, when the crazy stuff started happening, when I closed my eyes, a lot of just praying to the Lord, a lot of the crazy thoughts, putting the Lord first in my in my head, you know, reading, focus, reading the Bible, focusing on the Lord. I'm not asking you to become a religious fanatic. I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to is embrace the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Follow your Creator for once. Believe in Him. And how do you believe in them? You have to have an experience. 
that experience means, and I don't want to talk about experiential Christianity. I'm talking about you have to have a personal relationship. It only happens in these battles that you, 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 you go under, that putting your trust in him. And slowly what happens, at least for me, it didn't happen overnight. It was through time. Slowly, slowly, slowly those, those things have, have, have dissipated. And when I have a rough night or something like that, you know what I do? I can't sleep. I turn on, you know, I listen to something like a program like this or something that occupies my head and my mind with other than what is out there. Because I strongly believe right now, I mean, if you look at all of me, I don't know what it's like in, in Belgium, New York, but here, there's a new tower being built every freaking week in my, in my area. I mean, every time I go out to go shopping, there's a new tower. You know what I mean? Why do we have so many towers? Well, I don't know about towers, but they are building a lot here in Belgium right now, too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, centers, and I don't know. It, it's stuff. beyond communication, full quote unquote, with, with standard communication that we're all about. I really do believe it's, it's part of the new world agenda, if you will. Yeah. Uh, mind control. The point on, uh, on, on television I found very interesting. Uh, did you know that uh, Alistair Crowley was uh, in, uh, involved in the inventing of the television? Yes. Wow. And that would not be surprising now, would it? <laughs> so he's, called, he's called the Beast, you know? Yeah. And, and do you know who called him the Beast? It was his mother. Well, that says something when your mom, mom your old mom calls you a beast. <laughs> well, I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's all about um, conscience that we have to do. Um, we have to we have to divide right from wrong, and when we divide r right from wrong, this is why the evolution theory. Uh, it's just a theory and of course not right, uh, then you have to have a foundation on what is right or wrong. And the foundation was given us, uh, this conscious was given us by God. And God alone is the Lord of the conscience. And that is the very important thing. That is the truth that set Europe free. It's not me that said that, that is cited from Rome and Civil Liberty, from J.A. Wiley, page 13 to 16. And uh, I just uh, wanted to say that, and by that, uh, ending this show tonight, because I really have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> 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 so I think we are on for three hours right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, when, when you take Jesus as, as your guide in life, and God alone, uh, is the Lord of your conscience, then you can't do anything wrong. But of course you can do anything wrong for everyone who is in this world and who wants this world to keep on. And that is what Satan did. Satan told Eve, eat from the tree and you will not surely die. But you will become as God. You will know from good and evil. You will know like God, good from evil. And you will be as God. Yeah? Yeah. The first big deception that he did. He asked Eve, did God really say that you will die when you eat from the tree? He questioned the word of God. And that's what we have to do every day. We have to question everything we hear, everything we listen to in this world. And we have to measure everything by the truth and the conscience that God gave us. And when you are a true and a, 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 let's say <laughs> a normal person yeah, that has a conscience that doesn't feel good when stepping on a little animal just for fun or that slaps children just for fun, when you are not that kind of person, well, then you have God in you. And then you have to allow Jesus to come in you and to guide you. And when Jesus comes to you and guides you, you will do no wrong for yourself. You will do a lot of wrong for this world, but you shouldn't care for this world because Jesus is not of this world and we are 
just here to put on the test to see if we let the if we let the flesh conquer our minds or if we try our minds to conquer the flesh and the weaknesses that are given by the flesh. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know, you know, we look at this the world that we're in. We really are in the in the uh last days. I mean we, there the geoengineering is going on, the fake clouds, the lines in the sky, the uh what's going on with the towers, what's going on with the, these groups. These groups are walking around the streets and the neighborhoods, you know, with the, their minds whacked out from the music and from the television from computers. Not only that, they're actually being organized deliberately. You gotta ask yourself, who has the capacity to do all this? No little group, no little organization can do this. And people say, Well, it's the government. Well, ask yourself who actually runs your government. You come to realize who that really is. That's from and you know, it's 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 not me being a bigot, it's not me being a bashing Roman Catholicism, because you know what? You're not safe if you're Roman Catholicism in this co- a Catholic in this country. You're no more safe than someone who's not. You're, you're just as expendable to, to the leadership of the papacy and of Rome and the Jesuits than anyone else. They are more than willing, and they have demonstrated over and over and over again yeah, look at World War II and the number of Roman Catholics that they just sacrificed deliberately. For, you know, the ends justifies the means. You heard that phrase before that comes from the Jesuits. The ends justifies the means. They have no problem if they have that opportunity. If, if, if it costs them 20 million Catholics in order to get rid of, you know, you know, 25, 30 million Protestants or whatever it may be, uh, or Muslims, they don't have a problem with it. As no, long as the end, they, they, are, they are the soldiers of Satan, and Satan hates mankind. For Satan, it, it doesn't matter which man dies, as long as man dies. Right. And there's only one organization, organization in the world. People say, well, what about the UN? Okay, Rome actually controls and created the UN. Correct, Bjorg? Well, we had uh, <laughs> we had a broadcast on that with Alice Bailey and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know what I mean. So we say the more the more you look into this, the more you realize Rome controls the UN, the EU, the United States, the majority of the world, if not all of it. They're the ones who created communism. You know, <laughs> they're the ones who created fascism. They're the ones who created all these things that you know of. And it's not an exaggeration on my part. I wish it was. Because I don't get really much joy in this. The only joy I'm going to get in any of this is serving my Lord. And if I help one person come out, come out, my people. But you know what? We've done our job. And there's nothing more. I mean, there's, there is no, there's no paycheck. There's no, you know, accolades. There's no praise for man for what we're doing. And thank goodness. Because if it was that case, we probably wouldn't be doing it, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish up here, Michael. I thank you very much for the opportunity to having the show on tonight, and I really enjoyed myself. Uh, I, I I thought there was a little bit of um, uh, progress, <laughs> considering that we had a few guests on tonight, which I really enjoyed, and uh, then, yeah. then asking some questions, and we could go into that. I really enjoyed that very much. I hope uh, we will find some downloads, but anyway, uh, I will just finish with the same sentence that you said. Uh, every soul that we can catch uh, instead of the devil, that we can turn to Jesus Christ and to the truth and to the real meaning of life, um, is a soul uh, one. And um, therefore, I want to thank our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for giving us the opportunity to come on this broadcast here tonight. And um, I hope He will bless everyone who is uh, going to listen to this and everybody else, of course, also. And um, and I will look forward to the next broadcast that we will be having. And I thought that was for Sunday night at the same time we started. And we wanted to address the point that I made uh, in our last broadcast about um, why didn't the Protestants uh, 
the Protestant, uh, why didn't the Protestant movement, especially Luther, right. uh, emphasize uh, the keeping of the Sabbath the way that it should have been uh, done? I don't go into that right now, but that's the next, and we do that Sunday at the same time, right? Yeah, it was, well, yes, this, and Tom Fresh will be there, Walt Sickle, I haven't talked to Wayne uh, Michaels yet about that, but at least uh, the four of us have agreed. To, I've asked Blaine from Inquisition News if he wanted to join as well. And um, probably what I'm going to end up doing is having you moderate the show, if it's all right, because I will be highly distracted Sunday. Because yeah, of, that's, that, that's all right, but you have to finish the call. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll start it. I'll be involved as much as I can, but i got a three-year-old boy running around, so... No, no problem. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy every second that you have with your child, Michael. Enjoy every second. So, um, to finish up, uh, thank you for listening, everybody who listens here, uh, who was here for the first time, who is downloading that later. I hope you come back, and I hope you learned something you enjoyed yourself, like I enjoyed myself, spreading the, uh, yeah, the truth in the name of uh, our Father and Jesus Christ. Um, I thank you all and uh, wish you good night and God bless you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night, my friend. Bye-bye. Everybody else have a good day. And tomorrow night, uh, we've got, um, once again, a Romanism and the Reformation at 10 p.m. Eastern, uh, led by Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. And uh, I will most likely, if I have enough energy this evening, I will do finish up the... Um, Simon Peter versus Simon the Sorcerer. And hopefully, I'm not sure if Saturday we're going to have uh, Wayne Michaels on or not, but I have to talk to him about that and see how we're going to arrange that. So, With that, everyone, good night. God bless.